thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're now on the um, afternoon session of our open consultations. And I'll just um, hand over the floor to our chair, Lynn Sentamol, uh, to start off the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chengatai, and thank you for everybody for coming back so promptly as well. Um, we do have a lot to cover this afternoon, too. The first item is an update on the dynamic coalitions, and Aubrey Doria is going to provide that. She is participating remotely or online. So, Aubrey, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Can I be heard? Can I be heard? Yes, I can be. I see the scribe. Okay, so the two things. The dynamic coalitions have organized themselves over the last two years, and there is a dynamic coalition coordinating group that is basically working together to try and get a certain amount of parity in the practices of the dynamic coalitions. We put out a briefing um, note uh, which I believe uh, is, is, is available to everyone that's there talking about, and I'm not going to go into the details of it here unless there are questions, but, but speaking about what are DCs, how did they get started, uh, you know, how does one establish a dynamic coalition, what rules are there that apply to dynamic coalitions, and even though dynamic coalitions are bottom up and each one of them figures out its own practices in terms of how it's going to work. Certain things have been mandated in discussion with the MAG and in agreement among the dynamic coalitions themselves in terms of openness of lists, of participation, et cetera. So these things are defined. So they say those, those rules are defined. And it's you know open membership, open mailing lists, and open archives. And, and those apply to everyone. Um, the outcomes of individual dynamic coalitions work are, are discussed, they're, they're very varied, and so some of them publish documents, some of them have many meetings throughout the year. They all do do different things, but they're all required to do something. You cannot be a dynamic coalition and do nothing. Um, so, and, and each of them, and within the briefing, there's an outline of some of the things that have been achieved by the various dynamic coalitions. So um, then there's a section on how has it changed, how are they doing differently, and, and I sort of discussed that. But now they're sharing. For example, last year we had a shared session among in the main room uh, among the various dynamic coalitions who had put out a substantive paper during the year. It was, as far as I could tell, and from what I've heard from other people, a successful uh, session which we're planning to, uh, we've requested and put in a proposal to repeat again this year. And um, so, uh, let me see. And then there's a note on DC sessions at the IGF. Historically, the dynamic coalitions have the opportunity to hold individual meetings as part of the IGF program. DC requests for individual sessions are sent to and approved by the Secretariat. So they don't go through the workshop, though many DCs also organize with others workshops, and, and that is a, is a different. So um, the, the, the Dynamic Coalition Coordination Group continues. Marcus Coomer and I are the facilitators. Uh, Marcus is the facilitator for the Dynamic Coalitions and I'm facilitating it in kind of a connector role to the MAG. This is my last year in the MAG, so someone else will have to take that role next year. The, their, uh, the, the Dynamic Coalitions are discussing mailing list guidelines and such as that. So, so the work continues. The Dynamic Coalition Coordination Group meets monthly on, on average. So now we are applying for a proposed uh, session this time, very much like the one last time, that, uh, that each of the dynamic coalitions that wants to participate will uh, you know, have to submit some significant piece of work, either a paper or evidence of 
some other work and we're still working on the details of that. And then we'll have a similar 90-minute session, we're hoping. We have not been approved on the schedule yet, but we're hoping. Uh, we'll, we'll have a 90-minute session moderated uh, as it was last year by, by, by someone, probably the, the same person. Uh, Tatiana Tropina has agreed to do it again and uh, basically to pull out the commonalities among the work that the various VCs are doing. Uh, I think I'll stop at this point. I don't know if there'll be questions. I'll stop. I'm sorry the audio's breaking, Mary. I'm doing my best. Thank you, Aubrey. And your audio, just in terms of better or improving all of our process, your audio was fine here in the, in the room. Um, Aubrey did send a very useful document um, around about a week and a half ago that I think was quite thorough in terms of covering the dynamic coalition's activities. Um, both she and Marcus have put a lot of time and effort over the last couple of years in terms of trying to support that effort again in line with um, some recommendations coming out of the CSTD working group on improvements to the IGF. So let me see if there are any questions from, from the floor. Um, checking the speaking queue here. I guess she, you're in the, the floor, in, in the queue? Okay, and maybe Luis can help you afterwards get using the online system so that we've got everybody in, in one place that would help. But do you have the floor? Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know why we people physically in the room have to, be, have to wait uh, in the electronic queue. Um, but, uh, um, you know, uh, we, we uh, overcome all the difficulty come to room, have got to have some priority and privilege. The second thing is very technical. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the conference room service can tune down the temperature a little bit, because uh, after entering the room 10 minutes, I'm still wet, sweating. Thank you. Thank you. That would actually be quite helpful if we could <laughs> lower the temperature a bit somewhere in the room. Um, and, I, and I do feel I have to, to come back and just make sure that we're all clear on the queue process we're using. This is a multi-stakeholder forum, multi format. We accept speakers in the order that they requested the floor, um, which is pretty standard procedure in many meetings, um, many UN meetings included. So that is the procedure that the IGF has followed in its 12 years. It's the procedure that we will continue following here as well. Um, if you really object to using the online system, that's fine, but then I will slot you in when I see your request um, along, along with all the other requests. At which point, Lee, I can't tell if you're in the queue or if that was from before lunch, no? Are there any other requests for the floor on this topic? Then I think I'd just uh, emphasize again what, what um, Aubrey said and the, what she says in her and Marcus's report. The Dynamic Coalitions have really gone to um, some, I think, great lengths over the last few years to um, uh, I think pick their game up collectively and individually. Um, the work is really interesting. The reports are interesting. Um, I think they're contributing an awful lot um, to the IGF space in the IGF program in total. So I would encourage people to um, pay attention to uh, the work of the dynamic coalitions. And in particular, I know the MAG at the last meeting had actually um, determined that it was appropriate to look at the work of the dynamic coalitions and the best practice forums and see where we can continue to integrate them into all the components of, of um, what constitutes an IGF set of activities over the years. So if there are no more questions, again, I'm trying to wait the 30 seconds for the online system to catch up. And it does seem much warmer in here <laughs> this afternoon than, um, than this morning. So if something could be done to adjust it. That would be excellent. Um, the next item is updates on the MAG working groups. There are five um, MAG working groups that were constituted. The MAG working groups are primarily to help the MAG um, accomplish its set of tasks and agendas by putting working groups, a smaller set of group, to help advance the work. The work coming out of the um, MAG working groups goes back to the full MAG for um, approval as necessary or, or support. So it really is just a function to enable us to move forward more quickly with the work that's in front of us. Um, to that end, 
Um, we can ask for a short, um, hopefully again, short introduction from the facilitators or co-facilitators of those MAG working groups. Again, this is a community consultation, so we want a very short introduction and then really to leave room for the um, community to, to engage, respond, or ask questions. So I can choose you to come forward and talk about it, but, or Shagoon, do you want to go first and just give a very brief update on the Working Group on Communications and Outreach? Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Shagun once again. I'll be talking briefly on the Working Group on Communication and Outreach. Sorry. Okay. Those of you that are online, we're just trying to fix some interference here in the background. Shigun, would you mind actually just maybe shifting one seat over and seeing if it's just that mic? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for the little, uh, not really problem, but an issue. That's my no. Uh, now, moving forward, I um, just want to talk about um, the working group on communication and heart bridge. And um, the objective of the working group on communication is basically to continue the streams of work for improving the hygiene of communication and outreach across the stakeholders community. And um, we, have at, uh, we have put together the terms of reference which has been submitted to the MAG and uh, which has been approved. And we held our first meeting where the first uh, online meeting which we held a fortnight ago. But uh, what we uh, came to agree is that there is a need for us to enhance the role of the working group. And also we also emphasize that there is a need for us to work in synergy with all other working group and the coordinator of various uh, section or intersection activities. And uh, another area that we are looking toward to improve is how we can work with the host country, especially in the areas of uh, enhancing communication across the community. And um, for now, we are still continuing various uh, discussions. Um, we are having a meeting not just um, uh, within a few time, we, it's an ongoing meeting that we have both on the uh, MAG list and on Skype. And uh, we have continued to bring in people across the community to be part of that working group. But uh, what I, where I would really like to emphasize is that uh, there's a need for the working group to work together with all other uh, coordinators, and especially all the MAG members. Because I want to say that the, the role or the job of communicating the values of HIGF should not be left alone for the, the working group. It should be all inclusive and all um, encompassing uh, 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 engagement. Now, we are still looking at how we could also improve the outcomes of the high GLs, uh, the various outcomes of the high GLs 
especially the best prices forum uh, outcomes and the outcomes of various intersectional activities. That is, uh, we're looking at how we can provide them, then how we can um, communicate this outcome to the appropriate uh, stakeholders. That is the level that we have now. Uh, but what I would probably would like to say is that uh, we are still evolving and we are still engaging and we are still looking at various options where we can improve the reasons why we have set up. And uh, I think by myself and also member of this group, we've been talking to various uh, stakeholders, even right on this uh, platform. Uh, some of the stakeholders from the WISIS Forum, they've been asking questions and will be engaging. But we're also looking at how we can uh, improve um, working together with the Secretariat. And uh, we have emphasized that when we had our last meeting. And we are looking at uh, some uh, areas where we really need to improve that. We are looking at the possibility of sharing messages before such uh, messages um, go out to the community. Then we are also looking at how we can support the MAC chair especially in communicating and in helping to come up with various uh, messages which uh, the members of the group can work on and probably use to, to support the effort of the matcher whenever she is, uh, needs to engage in various uh, public uh, speaking on IGF. Um, lastly, uh, maybe I should use this forum. Uh, we have a, a, a minor contention issues where we are looking at the uh, need to bring in non bank members. And we are asking a particular question that uh, is it possible for us to bring in a member to serve as co coordinators? And these are the area that we are looking toward. I think um, along the way we've had a series of responses where. Uh, some of these issues have been uh, partially addressed. Uh, so I will use this opportunity to invite every one of us, most especially the uh, coordinator of the, the various group intersectional activities. There's a need for us to synergize our efforts, and there's a need to communicate shared values, and um, our message needs to be coherent. Uh, that is the level that we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Shigun, for this very comprehensive report. Um, I won't respond to the question about the MAG co-facilitators because, frankly, I need to think about it for a minute and, and, and just catch what is the current state across the MAG. I know some MAG working groups have supported that. I'm not sure if that's consistent or what the policy has been. So I think we just need to talk to the secretary to get that clear, and then we can revisit that at a, at a later stage. Um, let me move now. I think we'll just go through the updates really quickly. Um, and then turn it over to the floor for, for questions, unless there's anybody who really feels um, a need to comment specifically on that um, particular update. So leaving a bit of time, but the, the queue has been empty. There's no one in. So with that, I think I'll go to Avri Doria again, who's leading a MAG working group on IGF improvements. And then um, just so we manage the queue, uh, Miguel, Ignacio is, will be in the queue second um, to talk about the new session formats working group. So, Avri, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, so, the working group on uh, improvements, I think our full name is, um, well, let me find that. Our full name is Working Group to Support Evaluation and Implementation of Improvements to the IGF. For short, w, uh, Working Group IMP, IMP. Uh, we have a charter that's been approved by the MAG. Uh, it's a new group starting this year. We've been working on putting it together for a while. We're going to review the set of documentations for IGF improvement that documents uh, the direction of the community uh, on, on these things. We have the CSDD Working Group on IGF Improvements. We have a document that the MAG working group in 2013 did in response to it. We have 
two sets of recommendations from the un general assembly one when they approved the c s t d working group on i g f improvements our work and one when they approved our mandate and we have the gleanings from the death of retreat so our target is to go through this work measure it against the improvements that have already been made oftentimes you hear nothing's been done about the improvements but we see many changes and many of those changes are based on those recommendations but we don't yet have a clear handle on exactly which ones have been done the degree to which they've been done and which ones still need to be worked on so so that's going to be our main task will develop targets and milestones we'll talk about how to measure improvement and then we'll propose next steps for doing this so this is really to to understand where we're at so that we can continue the improvement it's not that improvements will stop while we're doing this they'll go on naturally as they have but we need to understand where we are and and be able to document it this group is open to both mag members and non mag members we did clear having co facilitators one from the mag and one non mag member we've also while doing that made sure that we have diversity of one male one female one from the north one from the global south so in picking two people we need to to satisfy those two requirements we're underway now secretary has gotten us a working list we're scheduling our first meeting for next week and there's information on the website that the secretary put up earlier on how to sign up thank you thank you Aubrey that was very clear I'd like to move next to the working group on new session formats and ask Miguel to speak this is the second year of that working group and last year we made some I think fairly important improvements which were really well received and we're continuing to build on that success and Miguel is again going to lead that uh, that working group Miguel you have the floor hi everyone uh, can you hear me yes can you hear me okay I'm so sorry I couldn't be there the some new members of my family I have to attend. <laughs> um, there, there's no, there, there's not uh, so much progress on the working group since we, uh, as last year happened, uh, we, we wait until the the work the working. So I'm sorry, the workshops are selected and then we start with our work in order to complete those. Uh, those spaces that we required uh, last time. Uh, I don't know if you are taking into account those spaces. I, I hope so. Um, we, we would need, uh, by now, we should have a, a meeting with the group on maybe in, in the following two weeks uh, to define what we need specifically. But uh, right now, I can tell you that we would need uh, at least a room for a complete day and uh, a space uh, every lunch break in order to have the the lightning session so there's not much progress on this just wanted to check with the secretary if you are taking into account those the, the, those things and and that's and I invite everyone to join the working group uh, after this selection process is over thank you miguel it's going to be tough to compete with last year's event though which took place out side lovely weather <laughs> in a big open pavilion um, but uh, I'm sure we'll we'll manage this year Russia Russia's leading um, a working group on the workshop evaluation efforts thank you Lynn uh, just a few words my name is Russia Abdullah I'm uh, leading uh, the working group on uh, workshop evaluation uh, last year, I think we got uh, quite a bit of work done. We've uh, s sort of revamped the system by which the workshops were being evaluated. Uh, so now instead of every single MAG member reviewing every single uh, workshop proposal, we've managed to uh, divide the work and sort of make the 
evaluation process more detailed so that each MAG member can give uh, more individual attention to each workshop uh, proposal. Uh, we're still going on with the work this year. We realize uh, the system is not perfect, of course, uh, so we're uh, aiming to fine-tune it for uh, next round. And um, in this regards, we particularly welcome uh, uh, all comments from the community. So if you have any uh, comments you would like to share with us on the uh, proposal submission process or uh, on your perceptions of the evaluation process, we, uh, we are very open to receiving that because this is uh, the basis from which uh, we will be working um, this year. Um, so um, please make sure you let us know if you, if you have any feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha. And the last working group that the MAG um, actually approved is a working group on IGF multi-year strategic work program. Um, based on comments that came through the uh, CSUD working group on IGF improvements, based on the WISIS plus 10 and um, the retreat that was held last year, organized by DESA, um, it was clear that there's more we can do to move from one year to the next year. And certainly with a 10-year mandate, we have the opportunity to now to take a much longer look um, at our program. So the MAG actually um, agreed to put a working group in place to work on a strategic multi-year work program. The charter was approved by the MAG um, approximately a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks. It is posted on the website and is now um, uh, shown here and in the Adobe Connect room as well. Um, specifically, um, the output from that effort is to be built um, with the IGF community, extending out at a minimum two to three years and it would cover expected major areas of work for the IGF, as well as all of its intercessional activities. So it is not um, redundant to or competing with the work on the IGF improvements. It's specifically to look at the strategic multi-year work program of the MAG. And um, I am chairing or co-facilitating that effort, obviously, and I'm on um, Aubrey's mailing list and effort as well. We will study very closely um, interrelated, and as items come up through the working group on IGF improvements, they will be fed into the strategic um, multi-year work program as well. Um, specifically, um, <clears throat> the goal is that the working group will work with the full MAG and the IGF community to deliver this living program, is the words we're using at the moment to describe it. And the goal is that that would be approved no later than IGF 2017 in order to support uh, the MAG's work next year. Um, the membership, it's open to MAG members and very much other members of the IGF community. And in particular, um, we need members to come in and participate from all of the intercessional activities of um, the IGF as well. We'll be looking for another co-chair, um, which I believe should be selected by the members of the working group. Um, on the uh, IGF website, you'll actually see the sign-up for the working group. Um, all of our lists, again, will be open to the public as well. We will follow the same um, uh, principles, protocol, if you will, as the other um, working group. That document actually talks to some of the relationship to other IGF efforts and the modalities we'll follow as well. But I think it's there. I won't, won't use a valuable face-to-face -face time to, um, to extend that. That is the last of the MAG working groups. So we've just covered the five. Maybe the secretary could go back to the, to the main list. And I'd like to open it up um, for questions um, from the floor now, from the community. Any comments, input, suggestions, concerns? Just giving a few minutes. A minute here to see if the queue populates. Saji, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I remember correctly, last time when we discussed it, uh, we have an agreement that uh, the co-chair who is non-MAG member shall be um, you know, agreed upon by the all the MAG members, right? Actually, that discussion was specific to 
the working group on IGF improvements who said they would, because of concerns expressed by the MAG, that they would bring that um, second co-facilitator back to the MAG, but that it was their full intent to make sure that it met all diversity requirements. Um, I'm certainly happy to do that for this one as well. Um, as I said, I think this is one aspect of our process that we still need to um, document in a bit more, in a bit more detail. But that specific agreement you are referring to, I believe, was only for the working group on IGF improvements. But I don't know if Avi or Chengatai want to come in and correct that's, me or. No, no, no. That's what I thought too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. G. Sorry to take four against the chair. As I understand, uh, this is a principle that uh, um, the same uh, principle or should be applied to all the working groups. Thank you. I, I think that's, I think that's a position. I don't think that has been agreed by the full mag yet. I don't actually expect there'll be a, a contentious issue, but it's not been fully agreed yet. So I have Ginger in the queue, and if there are, I, I see somebody who may have been trying to get in the queue here in the room. If you're having difficulties with the system, raise your hand, we'll allow you in, and Luis will also um, help you troubleshoot as well. But at the moment, I have Ginger. Ginger, you have the floor. Hey, excuse me. The Ginger is not connected on the audio. Now I'm asking you to connect. Thank you. So you said Ginger's not connected on the audio? He's connected, that we connect, but he's not connected himself to the audio, to the R phone. So I'm asking now him to connect. Thank you. In the meantime, is there anybody else who wants the floor? If you don't mind, I'd like to wait for a moment to see if Ginger does get connected. <clears throat> Ginger's been instrumental in helping us to advance a lot of our online uh, participation activities. So, uh, can you hear me? This is Ginger. I'm speaking from Wisconsin in the USA. Yes, and I can see the transcript shows me. Thank you very much for your patience. I am. Um, as we know, online participation isn't always perfect, but it is certainly getting better and better. I, I have to take the time to thank the Secretariat and Luis in particular for implementing the online queue, which helps level the playing, queue, uh, playing field and gives more equality for online participants. So thank you very much. The reason I'm stepping in right now is actually not as a MAG member, but for as an update of the previous working group on remote participation, which is no longer active. But I would like to point out to everyone, specifically everyone who is not on the MAG, that we welcome your input. We need your comments to improve. The people that are in the room want to help us, want to support us. But we also need to let them know what problems we're perceiving and how they can help us. Thank you very much to everyone. And we will continue to improve and to work with the Secretariat. Uh, so that means all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. I should also take this opportunity to recognize that Ginger has been instrumental in helping us um, with a lot of these improvements. And we always appreciate her for guidance and input. I do not see anybody else in the queue. For those of you just joining us in the afternoon, we are implementing a new online queuing system, but it does take about 25 to 30 seconds for a hand up to actually show here. So that explains the pause you are um, hearing periodically. So there's nobody else in the queue on that topic. So we will move to item 12, which is briefings from other related or relevant initiatives or organizations. This is the time when we actually give um, an opportunity to those activities for which we, we partner with or have something that um, is particularly relevant to the activities of the IGF to come and um, inform the IGF on their activities. And of course, that's meant to be a two-way street so that we can um, understand or evaluate where we might be able to interact or in fact engage more deeply so I see a hand up from Abu 
Yeah, we have Rintana, Renata, oh. Renata, sorry, Renata. That's in for Okay. Um, can you hear? Not fair. So, speak from here? Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, I just want to brief. Renata, could you possibly mute your mic or turn your volume off from the Adobe Connect? Hi. Okay, now it's better. Renata, so I just want to brief um, uh, about uh, a new group um, formed at the uh, Organization of American States event, uh, which happened uh, one week ago, uh, the Gender and Cybersecurity Forum. Um, it's an initiative to bring together uh, these themes uh, mainly focused on Latin American participants, but also um, uh, we spoke, uh, we had working groups, uh, and we spoke about uh, the dynamic coalition of uh, uh, gender in the IGF and the uh, best practice forum on gender and access. So uh, it is interesting to see that uh, the, the work the work done in uh, gender themes in the IGF is uh, uh, being uh, reproduced and inspiring new groups. So this was uh, an event by uh, uh, INSIBI, Inst Institute of Cybersecurity, uh, linked to the Organization of American States, but the group is broader, is uh, formed by a variety of uh, Latin American and Caribbean researchers and practitioners and professionals uh, in, in uh, cybersecurity. Thanks. Thank you, Renata. Carolyn? Carolyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to put forward, um, make an offer to the community who is interested. We understand a few months ago our president put forward um, a discussion on the Digital Geneva Convention. And since then, there's been a lot of interest and um, questions on what do we mean by the proposal, et cetera. Our policy uh, director for cybersecurity will be attending the WISIS forum on Wednesday and um, has agreed to make himself available to answer questions from the community on what do we mean by this and what are the elements of the proposal. So I want to make that available. Right now, we're tentatively planning for um, a meeting in the cafeteria. I understand that the cafeteria closes at 1.30 uh, or 2 o'clock, so if we can plan to meet around 2 o'clock or if you have interest, um, please let me know and um, we'll try to arrange a, a place to answer questions, um, you know, et cetera. Sorry, Carolyn, um, apologies. I think, were you asking whether or not it was possible to use this room? Yeah, no, I was just thinking that um, if it's of interest to everybody, to a, a big number of people, they can do it um, in the room that we're going to hold the mag. We, can, we, we, we are not going to be in this room, but in the next room. But, you know, he can do it just before we start or just after we start, you know, sometime like that to make it easier. Uh, thank you. Just to be clear, you're offering just after we start at 10 o'clock on Wednesday or? I'm sorry, I just want to make sure uh, I understand you clearly. Whatever time that is suitable. I mean, we can discuss it and then we can see. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for the accommodation. I know there are normally many other organizations that give, or intergovernmental organizations that give updates. Do I have my cue not refreshing? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I now have, um, uh, now have the cue. So I have Dereja Medic in the queue, Lee Hebard, and Flavio Wagner. So Dereja, you have the floor. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. I'm uh, Daria Medic, I'm, um, a digital artist and researcher from uh, Diplo Foundation's Creative Lab. And uh, I'm here to share with you a project we, are, we started developing and which will hopefully have its first iteration during the IGF this year. 
and it is about bridging digital art and the digital policy. So why bridge these two? It's kind of an open question. Um, is because digital policy and digital art basically deal with the same issues, but from different perspectives and using very different methodologies. And we think that today, in a time with uh, a growing complexity of the technological environment and also the social environment, we have a responsibility in bridging these different disciplines that could actually both complement each other and complement and bring closer these issues to a wider public. So for example, digital art is a field that can bring um, issues of digital policy and make them very tangible to a wider public through experiences that are, um, that are familiar to people. And it can actually um, help during, um, uh, during any sort of um, um, simplification of very complex systems. So uh, we hope that uh, during the IGF we will have a setup which will basically uh, function as a network uh, navigating through internet governance issues in the form of a subway map. So for example, you would enter a development line and you would follow this line which is for example in the color red and you would come to the issue of encryption. Uh, this issue would be explained in, uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, different sources of information and you would also have a digital artwork there that would, for example, show the future implications of analog cryptography in the 21st century. Then you can follow the development line, for example, or you could switch to, uh, for example, another line like the security line. So. Uh, in this sense, we have started collaborating with a lot of artists, uh, an international network of artists, and pre-curated works. We have also collaborated with uh, local art institutions, which, which could be valuable for having a local community here in Geneva, like uh, the HEAD and the EPFL from Lausanne, and uh, institutions, uh, international institutions like the Peace Art Institute from the Netherlands and uh, ZKM from Germany. And uh, in this sense, uh, it is very valuable to have any input that you could have, any ideas that you could have on, um, on uh, spreading light on these issues, on uh, how the exhibition could be uh, helped, uh, on funding opportunities, on logistical ideas. So if you have uh, any interest in this, uh, in this uh, project, uh, feel free to contact me. I'll be here until Friday. And uh, I hope that this is just the start of bridging these, uh, these topics. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Hibar, do you have the floor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Lee Hibar, Council of Europe. And to, just to give you, um, as one of these relevant organizations uh, under this agenda item, um, you know, the Council of Europe remains very busy in doing lots of things which relate to internet, internet governance broken into three parts, if you like, human rights, rule of law, and democracy, of course, on the internet, uh, digitization, culture, these things. Um, one very important thing which happened last week um, under, the, under the heading of rule of law is that the Convention on Cybercrime, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, uh, the parties to that convention, which have, I think, 50 or more now, um, have agreed to start discussion on a new protocol to that convention, perhaps the leading convention in the world on fighting cybercrime, uh, to help law enforcement uh, secure access to data in the cloud on different servers across the world, multiple jurisdiction issues. That's a huge step, uh, something to think about, uh, something which we can bring our experts to if, if needed. Um, on the front of human rights, we have a, a work which is going to be completed soon on, uh, on standards for or minimum principles for internet intermediaries from a human rights perspective, uh, on internet freedom and internet freedom indicators. Um, and on the front of um, democracy, uh, there's a lot of work on digitization, which I think li links into the proposal for the main session on democracy and digitization, um, on, on literacy, a new framework for internet for, for literacy and for an internet of citizens. Um, and we also have a, a World Forum for Democracy event coming up in November, 8 to 10 November in Strasbourg, 
which is talking about fears. Is populism, is a, populism uh, a problem? So fears, fake news, these issues around democracy and human rights, I think that's, that ties in very well again with the, that proposal. Um, and so there's quite a number of different uh, lines of expertise which are being developed. Uh, that said, uh, beyond, uh, also beyond the organisation, um, there are a number of issues which, are, which we're all reading about in the news which cannot be ignored, I think, in terms of thinking about what shapes this agenda. Net neutrality hasn't been mentioned, but it's on the agenda. It's, it's, it's a hot topic. Um, uh, countries are talking about global digital rules um, uh, or regulating the internet more and more. Uh, Microsoft launched the idea of a, of a, uh, a, G a digital Geneva Convention um, and we have the, the UN, um, we have the, U we have the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights talking about human rights in a changing world now. So there are actors and, and issues out there which, which I think need to be addressed. And I th what, what's clear from the point of view of Internet users, at least last week in, in Eurodig was mentioned, there was a, f a survey, a barometer of, of uh, opinions of Internet users and about how they saw the Internet. And, uh, and particularly their fears regarding the internet. It was mentioned that one in two uh, internet users uh, limits their activity on the internet for fears of privacy or security or other issues. So I think that also needs to be taken into, into consideration in how we um, shape these things. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lee. Flavio Wagner, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. So I'm not talking in my capacity as a MAG member, but as uh, one of the supporters of the Friends of the IGF project. So this uh, Friends of the IGF project aims at collecting on an integrated database and website all contents from IGF sessions since the first IGF edition in 2006, including all transcripts, audio, video, and reports. And the website offers various browsing facilities supporting search by contents, uh, people, editions, session, and so on. So it is, in fact, intended to complement the official IGF website, does not duplicate resources already available there. It has been originally created and supported as a voluntary collaborative effort from civil society. And since last year, the project runs with technical and administrative support from CGI.br, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. It has a, a small multi-stakeholder international steering committee for guiding its further development. Uh, Two of, this, uh, mem two of the members of this uh, steering committee are myself and Susan uh, Chalmers, also here present. So the, the website already contains the complete contents from the 2016 IGF edition in Guadalajara, which has been uploaded to the website. Uh, we are currently working on a new version of the website with new resources and more advanced browsing facilities, which we expect to launch before IGF 2017 in December here in Geneva. So please go to the friends of to friendsoftheigf.org, take a look and send us your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Susan Chalmers, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, uh, and greetings uh, to all Meg colleagues and IGF community members. Uh, this will be a brief general intervention on behalf of the United States regarding the IGF program. Uh, which perhaps should have been offered during the discussion this morning, so um, around main session agenda items. So please accept my apologies if the intervention doesn't align with the current topic. Um, in 2013, the MAG and the IGF introduced an open mic session to the program schedule. The open mic session enables attendees to share their thoughts on the IGF event and program, which can provide useful feedback for subsequent subsequent mags. Uh, these interventions are normally time limited. Open mic <laughs> sessions also have an inclusive and welcoming effect for people who are new to the IGF community. And so we would just like to express our support for the continuation of this relatively recent tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I agree it is a very, very useful, very important part of the, the IGF. Um, Shagoon? You have the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to bring to the awareness of the MAG member. Now, I'm speaking uh, not, not as a MAG member. 
there is an initiative which uh, is coming up from Nigerian side, and uh, it has to do with a new partnership which has been established between a center for cyberspace studies of the National State University and the Global Network for Cyber Solutions. And that partnership is about uh, is doing, uh, is about implementing a cyberspace governance and fellowship program, which uh, has been approved by the various authority. Now, the objective of the partnership is to um, trigger new interest in internet governance community fellowship, and also to stimulate um, um, a, a new research, because um, that will be the first time where we have a non-governmental organization and the university community coming together uh, to uh, develop capacity of the local young uh, professional within Nigeria and the uh, ECOWA space. Um, I would like to uh, call on the man member because we are still um, like evolving and we are learning from various uh, processes and various um, similar initiatives. Um, as we are moving forward, I would like the MAP member who are interested in sharing opinion with us, if they can please just see me. Thank you. Thank you, Shigun. Sala, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sala, Salenieta Tamaniko, I'm a for the record. Um, I'd just like to offer brief comments, one being um, just today the, there was a lunch organized by uh, the Pen Pacific, Pen African uh, Internet uh, Community, which was attended by some of the ICT ministers uh, along with the civil society, and we were invited to the lunch. And one of the comments that were made was um, some of the countries uh, face ch uh, challenges in terms of internet penetration at 3% still. Eh? Uh, so I, I found that interesting. These were, these were comments coming from them. Uh, notably, also uh, one of the one of the indicators that used to exist, which is why I like Lee's comments um, from the Council of Europe. Uh, one of the indicators that used to exist globally, which was heavily relied upon by the global community, regardless of. Uh, uh, which agency people were from or whatever sector was the ITU IDI indicators um, and clearly within the last five years we've seen that that's degrading because of the level of uh, statistics being sourced from the countries and uh, in terms of meeting the SDGs those continue to be um, a challenge because if you can't have accurate indicators you can't have proper policies, and if you don't have proper policies, you can't ship, uh, shift and shape or uh, stimulate growth. So, which is why I really like what um, Lee brought out, and uh, one of the things we could do is to look at how we could t uh, potentially tie those things um, from a global framework, uh, drawing from Europe, drawing from Africa, drawing from Asia Pacific, drawing from Latin America, Caribbean, that's one. Uh, and again, I offer these comments in my individual capacity. The second thing is, uh, within the first quarter of this year, we've trained uh, 22 facilitators in the Pacific. Um, we've just had the Pacific Regional Internet Governance uh, Forum. Within it, we had a youth track. We'll send you video summaries to the community. Um, and um, some, of, some of the challenges uh, that exist need to be thoroughly, robustly discussed within within those countries. And it's one thing to talk capacity, but the financial capacity to actually um, roll out some of these things, uh, actually uh, some of the deterrence. So it was very interesting to to note that the early this morning they had a capacity building session in one of the rooms uh, within the WISIS which was the, in the C2 room, which was chaired by uh, Alice Munya, uh, along with uh, various other stakeholders from the internet governance community. And, and some of the uh, things that they raised was that in, uh, there was a meeting held uh, in Geneva last year 
where there, was, there were discussions about how to tie these things in together. And I see these discussions happening in pockets and in silos. So uh, one of the challenges would be to how do we rope these things in together um, to consolidate it, noting that you have the Addis Ababa action agenda, noticing, noting that the second committee within the UN system uh, has set up uh, an infrastructure committee which is made up of governments and uh, uh, banks like Asian uh, Develop uh, Development Bank, World Bank and the African equivalent and so forth. And how can we uh, consolidate these things um, pertaining to bridging uh, development but using the internet as a catalyst. So that's something for the community. No easy answers, but that's why I'd like to pose the question to um, people within the room, particularly non-MEG members, uh, people from within the community, like sitting beside me is Project Connect. Uh, Sarah? Yeah. And so we'd, we'd really like to hear what they have to say and what they're doing so that we can potentially bring this thing in together and how we can capture it. Thank you, Sala. And it looks, Sarah, as though you're next in the queue. <laughs> well, great. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, so Project Connect is a new nonprofit that was started in January of this year. Uh, our main partners are OneWeb and UNICEF. And the goal of our nonprofit is to map every school in the world and measure internet connectivity at schools in real time. So we are working. Um, on the mapping component and also uh, working with existing tools and potentially building tools that will actually measure the speed uh, and other attributes of the actual connectivity at schools. And we are hoping to work with all of you to collect that data and collate it and also figure out how to make the platform as useful as possible for everyone working in this space. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lin. Uh, this is Xian Hong from UNESCO. It's a pleasure to meet with all the MEG members. And uh, I also like to share some recent uh, activities UNESCO is conducting. We are actually um, uh, launching a global consultation to develop uh, internet uh, universality indicators. We have um, already done a very successful and useful consultation at EuroDIG, at uh, Lee Hibbert just mentioned. We found it's a very useful network to connect into the regional stakeholders for us to make sure all stakeholders are equally consulted on this important in indicator. So we are also seeking the possibilities to do this similar consultation activities in the regional IGF in Asia Pacific, in Africa and the Arab states and also Latin America. So I wish those colleagues who are working on this regional IGF can reach to me and we can discuss further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody else in the queue at the moment, and I don't think anybody was able to join us from the World Economic Forum today. Um, but maybe just to mention that um, they have a project called Internet for All, um, which is actually working pretty actively in the regions and has really um, close uh, ties to our Connecting and Enabling the Next Billions project. Um, Raquel is sitting here nodding her head yes as well, but. Um, just to put that out there. I don't see anybody else in the queue. This is last call if you want to have a comment on this subject. Then we'll go to um, the last item, um, which is one we're really looking for um, a pretty sort of vigorous exchange. and. Um, I think we should probably um, ask the MAG members to jump in here as well. Um, a lot of our MAG members actually come from governments and I'm sure have a lot of um, informative experiences with respect to how we can um, encourage greater participation. Um, the the uh, agenda item actually says encourage governments and private sector participation. I think those are two of the areas where we feel we've had 
um, kind of lease representation, um, and both of them are different, different sectors with different needs and demands. So we'd actually like to understand <clears throat> what we could do to actually encourage more participation. Um, it's no good if we just have one or two of the stakeholders talking amongst themselves. That's not the purpose of this forum. And <clears throat> sorry. Um, and we've also had um, a request as well to um, have a short introduction on some newcomers track work, which is actually occurring um, in the IGF. Again, last year we put together a, a pretty extensive program to facilitate newcomers coming into the work of the IGF. And I think there's some new ideas with respect to how we might address that as well. I don't know, um, Slotoban, if you and Aida want to start with that just now, and we'll give everybody else a chance to kind of break ground with um, some of the other topics. But again, this particularly is going to um, talk to the newcomers' efforts within the IGF. Thank you, Slotoban. Okay, Slobodan Markovic for the record. Uh, I'm going to be really short uh, because uh, we are uh, we 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 actually do have I think time to uh, consider this uh, this track still. Last year uh, I think that we had uh, the first draft uh, in September. Uh, I don't think that we have to wait until September. Of course, um, maybe it would be a good idea to. Uh, to, to have this proposal considered by the MAG and probably uh, adopted, hopefully, uh, during the summer, say. Uh, the idea, the general idea is uh, uh, to, to put together a proposal for this year's uh, event structure, which is going to be pretty much the same as the last one, with a couple of uh, uh, tweaks here and there uh, uh, that are, um, the, the consequence of the lessons learned for the past year. And, uh, and it is the idea, my idea to send this uh, proposal uh, in a form of a first draft or a zero draft uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming days. Uh, we already prepared uh, uh, like a initial document in, in Google Doc. Uh, I think that, uh, that Bianca Renata and, uh, and Anya also took part in uh, this initial drafting. So this was like uh, just, a, just a heads up uh, for you regarding the, 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 the newcomers track for uh, 2017. Uh. Thank you, Slotterman. I don't know if Aida wanted to add anything, or Renato, or Bianco, or anybody else who participated in that effort. Uh, thank you. Very quick uh, advertisement, because I received several interest uh, coordinator on contacts about regional and the national IGF to help with the UNESCO consultation activities. We actually have a high-level session here at the Wizards Forum on Wednesday from 1 to 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And so that would be our opportunity for you to get to know more about the project, what indicator we are going to develop. Thank you. Thank you. I was just checking the chat room quickly as well, and I, I can't tell if there are some people that are having problems or if that was before lunch accessing. <clears throat> if people that are participating online are not able to get in the queue, if they can just signal it some way. I know Abood is actually watching the queue in the background. We'll make sure that everybody is, is getting in. And again, maybe that was an old, an old message, but I just want to make sure we're, we're doing everything we can to pull them in. <clears throat> if you'd introduce yourself too, please. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Muge and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, currently work with Professor Christopher Yu on a project called One World Connected. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce our uh, project which focuses on the innovative approaches on connected, connecting the unconnected. Uh, we gathered ICT related uh, initiatives and projects carried out by uh, various stakeholders and write case studies that inform the challenges on the demand and supply side, as well as the impact of these uh, initiatives on the communities. So we will be presenting the updates on our research during special 
SDG 9 session this week, and we hope to, hope to see you uh, in our session. Thank you. Next in the queue is Cheryl Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a point um, to follow up on your point on increasing participation from a private sector uh, standpoint. Is, would this be an appropriate time to raise that? I just wanted to mention, I think we're at actually a very interesting time um, with respect to the IGF's future. And is it, is it squeak? Okay, maybe it's better if I just do it this way. Put it underneath. Is that the problem? Okay. And um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to reach out now that we have the sustainable development goals to those different areas of our sector, or, or excuse me, those other industries that intersect with our sector in terms of bringing them in and educating them on the importance of the Internet Governance Forum and encouraging them, hopefully, um, to also become supporters moving forward. And so I think if we can continue to think creatively from that standpoint, at least from my stakeholder group's perspective, um, we will truly be able to sort of grow ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, and that's a, a key point. One of the critical factors for, <clears throat> sorry, for wanting to get to a strategic multi-year work program for the IGF, um, and we have a long way to go because this has not been discussed within the MAG yet, was but if we both had um, the venues noted two and three years out, um, and some idea of one or two main topics that were going to be of interest, we can obviously use that to reach out to stakeholders, all stakeholders, not just private sector, but governments as well, with enough notice so that the program can actually be built up locally, um, you know, with feeder events and obviously would support um, greater resources coming into the IGF, resources of, of all kinds. So that was one of the um, key components of that. I'll, I'll give you a follow-on, and then just so we're clear, I have um, e Just very, very quickly, I thought the presentation on the NRIs was really excellent, and it had me thinking, um, for those new um, national and um, regional IGFs that are in developing countries, can we perhaps start to work with those governments to encourage them to host an IGF in the future? We, we certainly can, and Chengatai and I are actually working that very hard. We have roughly 10 countries that um, are interested in hosting um, IGFs. A lot of interest in 2019, 2021. In fact, that is overrepresented in terms of the number of countries and interest. Um, you'll notice I didn't say 2018. Um, so 2018 is our priority at the moment in terms of finding a country that would host there. But the goal is, again, to get three, four years out, and we're confident we'll be able to get two, three, and four years um, settled quite quickly, but um, need to continue folks in 2018. And I'm sure the NRIs will note your, your point as well. So I have Yves Mathieu in the queue. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. So I'm Yves Mathieu from Mission Publique in Paris, France. Um, I heard that um, uh, there is a need in this um, uh, forum to feed the agenda of this cooperation between private uh, sector and government, and there is also a need to organize a bottom-up co contribution to the governance of the Internet. And uh, uh, we have the experience of involving lay citizens in global governance issues. Uh, two years ago, with the Secretariat of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we did organize a global citizens consultation forum. We involved 10,000 lay citizens, day-to-day citizens, in a full day of citizens' deliberation. And uh, these lay citizens have been invited to express their vision on what should be decided for the Paris Agreement of the COP21. And uh, the result of this day of deliberation, it was the same day all over the planet, has been a lay citizen vision on what would citizens would have agreed to put in the Paris Agreement if they had been the decisioners? And it's interesting to compare what has been agreed by, agreed by the government and what would have been agreed by the citizens. And when we, we make the parallel between climate issues and the Internet issues, there are many similarities. Uh, it's a common good. It's global. 
some uh, parties are tempted to close the borders and think that the closing the border will bring new solutions. Well, it is not the case. Uh, there is the issue of individual responsibility and also the need for a global governance. And uh, my, uh, my reflection here is to say that, uh, and, and it's also very complex, and the internet and the climate issues are very complex. And so my reflection here would be to say uh, there might be room f in the coming years to organize such a citizen deliberation and to say what people, uh, being the users of the internet or those living in areas with no use of internet, would bring as contribution to the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, Eve. Uh, Raquel, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I had two comments regarding disengagement of governments and private sector and overall stakeholder groups. Uh, the first one is perhaps repetitive, but to use the NIRs as a vehicle to increase this uh, this process. And I just want to highlight, um, Anya presented like Paraguay is doing the pre-webinars uh, for the, the the IGF itself, the, the event. It's not only that, I mean, Costa Rica and Guatemala are working at the same path. Uh, they're organizing their first IGF this year, and so uh, they're organizing also webinars where the government, the private sector, and civil society are engaged and, and making questions. They, they do uh, engage into a dialogue, really, understanding what is an IGF, what is the objective, and how they can um, have a role there. And um, I, I, I see this from experience. It's not that difficult in terms of, in, you know, it's a webinar. Uh, it doesn't have costs involved, and, and it really makes a difference. Um, and the second one, I was coordinating in Skype with uh, Miguel Estrada, Nacho Estrada, um, to also showcase what we did um, in terms of the IGF Lux space. Um, and prior, uh, when the, the uh, call for uh, workshop proposals went out, uh, we did also a couple of webinars in the region um, in Spanish and, and Portuguese. Many of the MAG members uh, from the region were involved, Flavio, Israel, uh, Renata, and myself. And uh, that also helped uh, not only to explain what the IGF was, but how to write um, and to participate in the IGF process, either the intersessional work and the workshop uh, proposals itself. So just to share a couple of experiences we've been dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Next in the queue is Marilyn Cade. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'm going to uh, respond to both um, the, the issue of how to get more governments to attend and participate, not just at the uh, global IGF, but also at the national and sub-regional, but also to speak for a minute about SMEs from developing countries. And I'm going to open my comments by noting that um, Small businesses from developing countries um, often do not um, have any chance of being um, financially funded to attend um, international meetings um, because they are in the business sector. And this is a real challenge for SMEs. There are, as an example, three SME business speakers from developing countries, one from the CASA region, sorry, two from the CASA region, and um, one from Africa that are not able to be here even at the WISIS forum, although they are high-level speakers, and they are very strongly involved in the IGF uh, activities at the national level and in getting their government ministries involved. And the reason I mention that is that um, I, I think we have to look hard at how important informed early invitations are. Not only for governments, I find, who very often need an invitation to participate, and just downloading a general letter from the website in many cases is not sufficient 
to reach new deputy ministers or ministers. So I'd like us to think about whether there are other ways for us to um, uh, support the idea of um, a different approach to invitations that may be able to be used to attract the government agencies. For the business side, very often invitations are needed as well. Uh, because unless they have a speaking role, and I'm speaking now only for SMEs from developing countries, unless they have a speaking role or they have a invitation that they can show to their board or to their uh, community that may support them, it's almost impossible for them to find funding and to also be able to leave their workplace for the several days. So invitations, but we must start earlier in explaining the value equation. I also want to note that I think we need to do a much more rigorous look at how we uh, refocus using the SDGs on different industry sectors than are presently um, attending and participate. We've talked about that for a number of years. We talked about it when I was on the CSTD working group for improvements. But actually taking the step to reach the energy sector, the financial services sector, the um, consumer products sector is something that I think we need to think about and try to make sure that we are not only targeting those players from um, North America or um, large European countries, but looking at how we might be able to um, attract um, um, a participation from other industry sectors that have a presence in other parts of the world. No, thank, thank you, Marilyn. Very, very good comments. Sala, you have the floor. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Salnieta Tamaniko Emoro for the record. Um, before I make these comments, I thought I'd just uh, shout out to. Uh, anyone who is in the capacity building uh, panel earlier who's in the room to make comments about um, the strategies that have been rolled out for government participation within the IGF processes in relation to ICANN and that sort of thing, uh, where you were doing it in Africa and uh, in the Pacific. I think it would be good to, for it to be shared in this community. That's the first uh, point. Um, so shout out to Alice if you're in the room to make brief comments, if possible. No pressure, that's one. The second thing was uh, just writing on uh, uh, what Cheryl had mentioned uh, and also what Marilyn had also mentioned. Uh, within uh, Oceania, uh, and Oceania has 27 countries and territories which are assigned CCTLDs, uh, we've started working uh, closely with some of the ministers uh, who've expressed interest in in rolling out capacity building within uh, within their countries. Uh, for instance, the Tuvaluan ICT minister who's actually present here in the WISIS, uh, we've been working with him for the past uh, four years. But today, he actually made a commitment to say that, uh, hey, look, uh, we want to have a, a core, you know, core facilitators uh, to own the initiative so that they can have this kind of dialogue. So in terms of uh, political will, in terms of interest from the diverse stakeholders, uh, those, are, those are platforms that's actually uh, open. And, uh, and uh, obviously we, we've been rich, we'll be reaching out to ICC bases in terms of strengthening the bridge between the private sector within Oceania and uh, ICC bases. That's, uh, that's the second thing. The other point I'd like to make is the comments offered by gentlemen. I, I'm, I apologize for not remembering your name because I'm severely jet lagged. Uh, but you made comments in relation to the Paris Agreement. And uh, we know in, uh, I'm speaking again in my individual capacity, uh, Ocean has been, uh, like the rest of the world, has been severely affected by uh, climate adaptation and climate change. And um, most of our countries in Oceania have uh, were some of the very first countries to sign on to the Paris Agreement. Now, on a practical level in terms of uh, internet governance, I've just spent the last, before coming here, uh, four weeks ago, I was in Vanuatu, which is a country in uh, the Pacific. 
And one of the biggest challenges there is the geospatial data is not stored locally. And um, it's actually uh, stored in Australia, believe it or not. <laughs> and that's one, the satellite images. And uh, that has massive implications. Uh, the, the other thing also is their national GIS data. Uh, they recently lost and they, they're kind of plotting it all over again. I know this for a fact because I asked for certain images to be pulled. Um, and that's what I was told. So that's, uh, these are practical issues. Eh? And, so, and so in terms of, uh, uh, and I noticed that um, in the last IGF last year, there was a young man who was an ISOC, is, do you call it new ambassador? ISOC ambassador? The, yeah, he was part of the ISOC ambassador program and he's from Kiribati. And he was like a lone voice in the wilderness. He stood up during the open comment, open mic uh, session. And he raised that uh, one of the things he wished was for there to be more uh, discussions within the IGF processes um, linking uh, climate change. So I just thought I'd mention that since he's not here, but I thought I'd just echo that. Thank you, Sala. I don't know why humans haven't evolved to have eyes on the side of their head or why my memory wasn't better, but I actually meant to turn to Thomas after Marilyn's comment and um, forgot. So Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. Uh, <laughs> Lynn, and I <laughs> these American names, it's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> you should have Swiss names, that would be easy for me. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, support what Marilyn had said, and, and indeed, uh, this is, of course, very important to, to use all the channels available to invite, uh, always to the ex extent possible, also on a personalized level, um, uh, key players to, to come to the IGF. And I can just tell you that we are, uh, <clears throat> in addition to our personal discussions, that we, we uh, are my president or our president is inviting all her, uh, the people that she meets uh, to come to the IGF herself in person. We are also uh, preparing letters from her to, to, to others and, and we'll use all our channels that we have also as federal office that is at the same time part of a ministry as well as a regulator for different fields uh, that we uh, will reach out to our colleagues uh, in other countries and also to other stakeholders, not just government agencies to, to um, invite everybody to come to the IGF. So we're trying uh, to use everything that comes to our mind to actually spread the message. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Carlos Fonseca, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, just a word on um, this uh, engaging uh, the government thing. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be discussed tomorrow or not, but just a, just a, a, a thought about that. Um, I was. Uh, Looking at the proposals, uh, workshop proposals, I was uh, making some math, and uh, turns out that uh, I think uh, when you uh, consider private sector proposals, we have around 27 overall, and about eight or nine have been uh, approved, so about a third. Uh, inter IGOs, I think they present around 19 or 20, and about half of them were finally approved. Government proposals were eight, and none of them were approved. So th this this is something that caught my attention. Um, I, I don't know how to explain that. Maybe it's a, the way governments work, or maybe they are not capacitated and don't know how to work this kind of thing. And I know there are uh, the open forums and, and all sorts of uh, 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 opportunities for governments to just come in and, and take part of that. But I think it would be important to, to engage uh, government at this point. I think it's unfortunate that they are not more engaged than they are right now. And uh, particularly, um, and I'm, then I'm speaking as, as, as government here, and I know that in the case of Latin America, many countries, starting with Brazil, but not only Brazil, Argentina, 
and, and others uh, are, are currently engaged in, in, in building their own uh, digital strategy, national digital strategy, which is, a, which, which is a very important thing. Brazil is doing it right now. Argentina is going to start uh, by the end of this year, and, and, and Argentina is, is presiding the G20 and the, the uh, Digital Economy Task Force. I know that Chile just announced its uh, uh, digital security strategy. Uh, Mexico has just uh, uh, revealed his, uh, uh, its, its uh, telecom policy and regulation, and so on and so forth. So I think at this point in time, it's very unfortunate that governments that are engaged in, in, in building a, a a, a national strategy are not more uh, uh, engaged in, in this sort of exercise. So I, I wonder, um, and this is an open de debate, I don't have an answer. Um, I have an example. My own government has proposed a uh, flash um, workshop, 30-minute workshop, and it, it hasn't passed the first screening. So. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, of uh, capacitation of uh, uh, governments uh, knowing how to do this sort of exercise, this sort of proposal, um, and what could be done, and just, just um, raising this question and maybe it could be debated tomorrow further, but uh, um, just wanted to, to uh, to point that out and, be caught in, and the fact that no, no proposal by the government uh, finally uh, was accepted. So and this is unfortunate. And of course, uh, this sort of thing uh, is, is not uh, something that will engage further government if, if no government is, is accepted in the workshop. So maybe next time no government at all will propose anything. So I don't know, it's just, uh, uh, just proposing this debate. No, thank you, Carlos. I mean, that's actually, you know, an, an important set of comments, and some of it we will certainly get into um, tomorrow. Maybe just one or two um, quick reactions. Um, there's a difference between government submitted and government participation, the point that was made earlier, and I think we need to find a way to track that a little bit better. Um, I think the, the reason we the reason there is a MAG that actually meets to deliberate on those workshop selections is that that preliminary screening is, it's, I'm trying to find the right words because I've used some words on an online MAG list that wasn't working with respect to review and evaluation. But the MAG owes looking at the results that came out of that screening from the MAG and saying, does this, does this look appropriate? Are there any imbalances or, or overrepresentation that we need to adjust for? And if so, how do we do that? So it's not a rerun, it's not a re-review or a re-evaluation. It really is what additional, the MAG has a lot of tools available to us. What additional tools can we put in to ensure that we have a program that is appropriately representative? Um, so I think some of that will come out um, over the course of the, the day tomorrow. But I think your other points were really, um, really helpful as well. One of the things I was, I was thinking, I'm not quite sure how to process this, but if I think about the work of the Working Group on Communications and Outreach, and I think about all the efforts Switzerland has put into and have indicated they're willing to put into with respect to reaching out to governments, but IGOs as well. I mean, it's really senior policymakers. Whether or not there is some sort of um, really concerted effort we can do by country um, taking advantage of things such as the, the various digital strategy plans that countries are doing. So maybe there actually is a very targeted, you know, and I've, I've said to the Working Group on Communications and Outreach, I think it's important that we choose a relatively small number of things we can act on because the remit is broad. Um, but one or two really targeted things could have a tremendous impact. So maybe we can continue to noodle that around a little bit more and see if there is a specific targeted set of outreach activities we can do to um, to help that. Um, so the people I have in the queue, just so we're clear, I have Renata, then I have Juan Fernandez, Arnold Van Rijn, and I think there's somebody else online that's trying to come in, if I understood, I would signal correctly. But they would be the fourth in the queue, because the others were in the queue ahead of time. So Renata, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to collaborate with ideas in integrating government and private sector into the debates. I would be speaking now of the head of moderator of LACNIC, IT Women Community, 
un until my last meeting, the experience we had. This was quite a quiet community, then a strategy pushed by a few members, like uh, me, Jacqueline Morris from Trinidad Tobago, Lilian Bruges from Colombia. We started a series of monthly webinars with the goal of organizing collectively sessions during the organization meetings. These thematic debates have invited members from government, private sector, and other stakeholder groups, made the community grow exponentially, and made the participation in LACNIC increase notably. LACNIC staff did a great job of coordinating the strategy with us. Uh, Raquel Gato is also a member of this, this community and also a participant in these online and on-site uh, debates at the meetings. And I'm sure IGF intersectional activities can focus more on inviting or engaging speakers from different regions and stakeholder groups, so they can also bring these point of views to the IGF. Thanks. Thank you, Renata. Juan, Juan Fernandez. Thank you for the record. This is Juan Fernandez, as a MAC member. And well, good day to all, because it's the first time I take the floor. I'm not going to make here a concrete recommendation because I think this is a very serious problem that deserves to be studied in depth. And I think that the two working groups that are already, is, is on, on, or already on, the one on the improvement of the IGF and the newly created of the multi-year uh, strategic work program, should have this as its, one of its main concerns. Because I think this is a serious problem, or, or at least is a serious symptom, it's a symptom of a serious problem. And the problem is that one way or another, uh, the IGF is not being interesting to two of the stakeholders that are supposed to be here. And as I said, I don't want to hear to now to do all the analysis. I think it's analysis that have to be done on that. But I only want to share some thoughts around this. And it's very simple. I think that we have to go back to the roots of why the IGF was created. And it was created to have policy dialogue. Policy dialogue that helps whoever is not to discuss who's going to elaborate or make the policy, but helps those who will make policy to make good policy and take into consideration everybody's concerns regarding those policies. In this sense, governments mainly comes in a hearing mode to listen to some of the other stakeholders that normally doesn't have interaction with and to really take into consideration their concerns to the policy that they enact later on. Private sector, what's the role of the private sector? To come and to participate in this policy dialogue by putting forward their own concepts and ideas because normally they're also not taken into consideration in the policy making process that is being done elsewhere. So I think we have to take back, to take this into consideration and put it back into the core of the IGF. This is a task for the MAG and for the Secretariat, and I think that the MAG and the Secretariat is working on it uh, with less or more or less success. I can say, for instance, that in this year's workshop, I think that we're getting back into that thing of making interesting policy dialogue, because there's a lot of discussion on uh, new emerging issues that needs to be discussed in, in order to get policy, like the uh, artificial intelligence, the new Internet of Things, and uh, shutdowns, and hacking, and, and, and there's a lot, a lot of things. And having said that, I think that we have done some mistakes, because we have, part of, of us, have taken the IGF as we say, I don't know this saying, to blow our own horn in, in a way to, to uh, I don't know, to uh, delight ourselves with things that we, or we already like. Uh, we heard this morning, for instance, uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to mention any of the tags, but uh, I think that we have done, um, we have uh, done some excesses by underlining some of the issues uh, add to the nausea boom that we're already, by doing it again and again and again, it loses interest, so people won't come here. And many of these issues are discussed elsewhere, even here in Geneva. So government will go to those forums and not here to listen to this. So we have to go back to internet. We have to go back to the internet policy issues that are not discussed elsewhere 
and to focus on that. If, if we keep doing here the same thing that have been discussed in some other places, people won't come here. And those, the, those two stakeholders will definitely not go here. We could invite them to be here. It's nice. We could give, I don't know, some other thing to invite. But the really good thing is to make this interesting for them. That's the only way to guarantee that they will come, they will come in their own. We have to go back to make this internet governance forum. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Juan and I had a long conversation yesterday. I invited him to be a member of the multi-year strategic work program effort. Um, in the queue now I have Arnold Van Rijn and then I think an online participant and Nigel. Arnold, you have the floor. First time to press the button. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Arnold van Rijn, for the record. I'm a MAC member, but now speaking uh, in my capacity as representative of the Dutch government. This is very interesting um, issue we are discussing. How can we attract more companies and uh, governments to this wonderful forum? I have four suggestions which came out right of my mind. There are many more, but I'll just name a four of them. The first one is governments should open their windows more, get in contact with their stakeholders, reach out and discuss um, things about new policy making. At least this is the experience which we are now uh, undergoing in the Netherlands. Uh, from scratch, we are cooperating with our partners, with our stakeholders, part private sector, the civil society, technical community, you name it. They are sitting around the table uh, to find a new policy which the government at the end should, uh, should agree upon. Um, this works very well because, in, at least in the Netherlands, uh, the government is getting uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, we have to do the same work. We are faced with budget cuts, so we have to, to uh, seek uh, cooperation, and I must uh, tell you it works very good. Um, we apply this new way of working uh, in several fields, uh, from human rights to uh, cybersecurity. Our government has sent out a letter uh, with our human rights policy. Uh, the last uh, document, the document uh, the government sent out to uh, Parliament, uh, uh, is dealing with inter our international cyber strategy. It has been uh, formed and based upon uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation with our stakeholders. So a plea to other governments to do the same, because at least this is the, the way we are working here in the Internet Governance Forum, cooperating between ourselves, between the, 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 uh, the stakeholders involved. And second suggestion, translate the concept of internet governance. I have had many talks with uh, companies and you, you could see their faces when you say, well, I'm, I'm dealing with internet governance. They didn't understand the concept. Uh, it was quite vague. But if you're explaining it's all about cybersecurity, Internet of Things, blockchain, uh, human rights, you can go on. Then you see their eyes are going to, 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 steer, to, to steer up and say, hey, this is something we should be discussing too. Um, so that, that is, I think, a task for the, the, the MAC members and, and the rest of the community to uh, explain more to the private companies what does Internet governance mean. Third suggestion, uh, we are going to discuss as MAG tomorrow uh, the workshop proposals. There are many, many good proposals. Um, but I noticed that the titles are sometimes quite long and vague. So my suggestion would be, as for the future, for next year, make titles more results-oriented, focused, and catchy, and perhaps end up with a question mark, because that triggers the, uh, the people who are going to uh, attend meetings to, to find their solutions themselves, to say, hey, what is going, coming up? Uh, can, we, can we contribute to that discussion? My fourth and last 
suggestion is uh, get in contact uh, with others than the traditional sectors we are dealing with, that is the telecom sector and the internet companies. Let's get in contact with uh, the companies who are working in the health sector, transport sector, banking sector, because when we have our meetings, they're, they are missing. I mean, uh, we should do additional work to uh, get them around the table. Well, this is, these are four suggestions I would like to share with you. Uh, but again, there are many more, and we can discuss this further in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. That's very helpful. Let me just cover where we are in the queue, because right now I have more people not using the electronic queue than. So Christiane Roy should come out. She had to leave. She, sort of, she apologized. Um, which means I have an online participant, if there is someone still there. Then I have Nigel, then Jack, who is in the queue, then China, Lori, and Lee Hebert. So I apologize um, and really would encourage people, again, to use the online queue as much as possible. It really does become somewhat difficult otherwise. But everybody is being recognized in the order the request um, came in. Uh, so with that, um, is there somebody in online? Mary, you have the floor. She's not answering, sorry. Sorry, when she comes back online, let me know. We'll put her um, back in the queue. In the meantime, we'll go on to Nigel. Nigel, you have the floor. Yes, and uh, good afternoon. Whoops, he says breaking his glasses. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. And yes, it's only one arm that's broken, so it's okay. Uh, I apologize, first of all, I tried to use the, uh, I tried to use the online uh, route, but uh, Working for ICANN, it's difficult to understand some of these online uh, methodologies, uh, and I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, but I'm, I'm delighted again to be at an open consultation, and uh, I realise I, I, I should have probably said a few words in the in the previous session, but I, I, I came into it late, and apologies for that. So, if I may just say uh, two or three things. First of all, on on this particular issue, I I, I think some of the comments we've heard have been exceptionally important. For those of us that are absolutely committed to, to, to the IGF and see it as the, uh, the prime vehicle, if you like, to have these internet governance discussions of, of, of whatever nature, and I, I, I take the uh, comments of Juan into consideration here, I think it's, it's very important that we do concentrate on some of the key issues that uh, that society is, is, is grappling with and particular governments are, are, are grappling with. Because if we are going to, if we are going to sort of realise this vision whereby governments sitting at the table and participating or listening or, or, or whatever, and I realise there's a balance there as well. I mean, it, it, you don't have to have workshops to take part in the IGF, which is, I'm sure, a comment that's been, been made before. Some of the beauty of the IGF is being able to, to, to listen to the dialogue and, and, and get new ideas and get inspiration from the dialogue. And then to go away as governments, as, 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 as some of us have done in the past, and go to IGOs and go back into your national regional governments and say, hang on a minute, have we got these policies right? Are we doing what, what's really uh, what's right in, the, in, this, in this area? So I think that's one of the key areas. And for that to happen, of course, we have to have the relevant subjects. But then this is the IGF, and we are, we are con conditioned and constrained, of course, by the, the proposals we have in. And I, I don't know what the proposals were in the, uh, for the workshops, but I'm sure that there's enough interesting topics and relevant topics, and some have been mentioned. I mean, governments are grappling with blockchain. Governments are grappling with uh, the Internet of Things and the cyber-related security aspects uh, related to it. Governments are grappling with data, data protection. Okay, we've all debated data pr privacy and we've all debated cybersecurity at length, but some of the practical issues of how governments are going to tackle the European GDPR, how we are going to respond to that as a, as a society is, 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 I think, is, is, is very important 
indeed. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased we're having this debate. ICANN, uh, again, tries to work at its best. We, we, we're faced with similar, uh, if you like, similar issues in that we, we can only be legitimate as a, as a global multi-stakeholder body if we have all people at the table, if we have civil society, if we have academia, if we have governments, and, and, and business, and we, we, we strive to get that, to get that balance. We're, we're very fortunate in the, in, in the Government Advisory Committee in that we do have had a, a, an excellent run, if you like. Uh, uh, we had a quite a good chairman, uh, you know, some Swiss guy that chaired the uh, Government Advisory Committee reasonably well. Uh, <laughs> so, but, I mean, being, being serious, I mean, but we recognize, we recognize that in, within Within, within ICANN, that we need to do more to bring governments to the table. And Anne Rochelle and Alice hosted a, a session this morning, which I think you know has been referred to. And uh, I unfortunately di didn't didn't get to it, but obviously know quite a bit about it. And there, uh, uh, Anne Rochelle and others explained some of the incredible work that ICANN has been doing in in terms of the underserved regions. And I, I say that because I haven't been doing it at all, but but others have that are, are, are far better qualified than I have. And I, I think the effect of it's happening, it, it, it's having is, is, is very beneficial. And at the end of the day, perhaps some of these governments won't be able to come to ICANN and they won't be able to come to the IGF. But as long as they can understand what's happening, if they participate in regional and national events, if they take part online, then they are making this, this contribution. And I think that's, uh, that's so important. And I, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, we have Jack in the queue next. And Lewis, I don't know if you can take Christiane out of the queue because she had to leave the meeting. Thank you. Jack, you have the floor. Hi, thanks, Lynn. <clears throat> um, so I'm speaking not as a MAC member, but as um, APC. Um, so this is Jack SM Key from Association for Progressive Communications. I just wanted to comment on two things. Um, one is around the whole, um, the whole conversation around capacity, the need to build capacity of governments, for example, in order to um, develop better proposals and so on and so forth. And I think that is actually um, a really, really um, critical thing. Um, so I would like to share um, APC's initiative in this effort, uh, which is the African School of Internet Governance. Um, this is something that we actually um, collaborate and work jointly with an intergovernmental organization, the African Union Commission. It's the fifth year running. It's, uh, a, <clears throat> it's basically a capacity building um, initiative and effort to bring together not just um, um, governments, but also other, civil, uh, other stakeholder groups into the process to think about what does it mean to engage and participate in internet governance in the multi-stakeholder platform. Um, and it can't be stressed enough that um, such initiatives, so it's by no means the only one, I think there are more and more um, internet governance schools that are being um, developed, um, that it, is, it does play quite a critical role in terms of increasing participation by different stakeholder groups into this process. Every policy process, even if this one is primarily around dialogue, um, has its own principles, sets of values, priorities, and it, it does require some level of um, familiar, familiarization to know what's the best way to build into this. And as part of this as well, um, we also do this gender and internet, <coughs> gender and internet governance exchange that then looks into integrating gender and also increasing women's participation in the process. So that's, um, that's one. And the second is around sort of the value of IGF um, in, terms of influencing the, uh, in terms of influencing policy development um, in that um, it can really greatly contribute to this, as Juan is saying. Um, and the value is also about linking between what happens at the IGF with other intergovernmental policy processes. So for example, um, uh, as this is probably already pretty familiar, but when LaRue was participating, Frank LaRue, when he was the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, when he was participating at the IGF, um, one of the outcome, outcomes of that was the very infamous resolution around all rights that apply offline also applies online. So it is that kind of a, you know, it is a very, very robust space to understand the different dimensions of a particular policy issue and emerging policies that shifts very quickly as well, which is what Nigel was also um, alluding to. Um, and um, so I think Anriet already spoke earlier about how the best practice forum, um, the, 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 the conversations from the best practice forum on gender and access also helped to inform the OHCHR report on gender, human rights and access. So I would like to end by sharing APC's proposal um, to the working group on enhanced cooperation. 
um, which is that to explore the establishment of an IGF-linked platform for dialogue amongst governments on internet-related policy, public policy issues. So this can possibly help address the IGF improvement, um, the IGF goal to increase government participation, to create a space for non-binding dialogue amongst governments on internet public policy. Um, if you would like to know more, I can send this also to the MAC list. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Ji, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to echo what has been said by Huan very correctly, that uh, uh, to make uh, IGF and MAC's work more relevant, uh, we really do need to go back to business, to go back to internet governance per se, rather than extending further and further, deviating further and further from our, what we should do. For example, human rights. Whatever we do in this world, we, every one of each and every one of us are trying to make our life better. So what does human rights mean in, in the context of internet governance? Internet itself should be human rights neutral. So if we, you know, um, but uh, my experience of screening the workshop proposals is that everything is about human, about human rights. That's a disastrous proliferation. And we should, uh, um, you know, have some discipline and uh, bear in mind that uh, we should do some real business on internet uh, governance. Second thing about uh, uh, gender issue. I, I really don't understand what gender issue means in this context. I look at this room, our chair is female, and uh, I counted the head in this room, um, seems that there are more females than males. And if, we, if it's about uh, internet governance discussion, and then gender is not a problem. In China, we tend to buy a better um, mobile phone, smartphone for boy, uh, girlfriends and wives. My, my myself was using Huawei and my wife is using the latest uh, iPhone. And they tend to spend more time on internet doing shopping. This is a big worry for me, of course. And this is a big problem. Um, but uh, for some countries, some uh, societies, they tend to discriminate uh, bully males, tend to bully females. That's not an internet uh, governance issue. That's their societal, cultural, religious issue. They, so I, I hope that we can go back to more cybersecurity, latest technology, um, et cetera, those things. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, the richness of a multi-stakeholder model, of course, is that we have, and the richness of a global model is that you have a really broad set of perspectives. Um, I think I can leave most of your comments alone, but I would say one thing, which is simply that this room isn't necessarily representative of the world um, at all. And, you know, I'm also very honored to be the first female chair, but I was the first female chair after 10 years. Um, <laughs> I was also the first chair after 10 years that did not come from a government. It came from the technical community. So there are still lots of things we need to continue addressing as we go forward. And, 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 I, and I say that with the greatest respect for all the opinions in this room. That's why we're here. That's why the Internet Governance Forum matters. That's why multi-stakeholder matters. And that's why um, allowing all voices in the room on these discussions is so critically important. And, um, and I do have to say, I think we still have a significant way to go in most forums that I participate in and frankly in most activities in my in my day. Um, I will go back to the queue. I had Lori in the queue, then Lee, and then we'll go back to the uh, online queue. So Lori, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Secretariat, Jenga Jai. It's, it's nice to see everybody. Um, I want to echo some thoughts that have been expressed and I have a few ideas and suggestions. Um, First of all, I think the idea of what does internet governance mean absolutely should be related in terms that private sector actors can relate to. And I don't think that happens now, particularly when speaking the language of SDGs. SDGs, we understand as NGOs and inside of the UN system, but outside of it, I can say with complete authority, not understood in the private sector. 
By way of example, I, I'm pleased to say that my organization, the International Trademark Association, hosted a first workshop ever on the value proposition of trademarks to small and emergency emerging businesses in ICT for D today. And the questions that emerged were, were, I believe, very interesting and valuable to launch new discussions. But part of, it took three years to get the workshop here. And one of the reasons it did is because I had to serve as the translator between what the UN expectation was and what my members, who were mostly private sector actors, many Fortune 500 companies, um, some small and emerging businesses, where is the value proposition? What is our return on investment? How does this affect our market? Well, these are terms that are not necessarily spoken often in these circles. These are the terms that in order to relate why it's important, it's important to come up with that case statement. So I would, I would offer that as part of the communications working group that we think about how do we speak to the private sector specifically. Um, I would also say in terms of the, using words submit versus participate. I understand the distinction you were making, but I would say that in the private sector, submitting is equivalent to participating. I, I've seen the use of that wording in my own association where we would submit a proposal and then the report we would get is we've participated in IGF. So again, I think distinguishing what participation means in the private sector would be extremely important. I would also offer, if not already done, and I don't believe it is, that it might be very, very beneficial to have a workshop on workshop proposals. Have those who have successfully submitted proposals work with either do it, I would suggest online, a webinar, for those who are interested, and, and enough time in advance to really, particularly for the private sector, to prepare. Because although the private sector may be perceived as having more resources for travel, we don't. Most corporate budget, budgets are put in at least a year in advance. We don't operate on grants. We operate on very hardcore net revenue returns. And I know even in my own association, we were asked to do a lightning session two weeks prior to IGF in Mexico. We were lucky in that we had members on the ground in Mexico. We were able to recruit an, an SME blogger, a female blogger from Guadalajara. And then we brought in a very active member from Mexico City and we were put together what I thought was quite an engaging lightning session in Spanish and English. We have that flexibility, but I will say that most private sector organizations do not. And so my final recommendation would be to start working with trade associations. Because most private sector actors are going to be involved in some kind of association that advance their immediate business needs. As in my case, it's trademark protection and associated intellectual property. And there's been a lot of back and forth about what that means because intellectual property in this space is very loaded and it is perceived as something that infringes upon free speech when in fact there can be dialogue about balance. And if we're talking about ICT for D and development and sustainability, if we don't figure out how to help businesses protect themselves, those businesses go away. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate the comments. Next in the queue, I have Lee, Lee Hebard. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lee Hebard, Council of Europe. Um, just one real point of context. We're in Europe um, for this next IGF, and uh, there's quite a lot of low-hanging fruit regarding uh, cooperation between governments and the private sector. And I'm thinking about the different initiatives which have uh, been happening over the last, say, couple of years. Um, the European Commission has a code of conduct which, which concerns uh, looking at you know, hate speech online amongst other things. So that's something which is ongoing, which perhaps the Commission could contribute to. Uh, the German Ministry of Justice has also been involved in discussions with Facebook on, on the same matter. And, and I think other governments too have been discussing this. So there, are, there, are, there, there, is, there is cooperation, there is, there is discussion. You just, know, you just need to know um, maybe who to address. Um, there's also the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights, which meets every year in Geneva. I think maybe it's November time. So that's another low-hanging fruit. Maybe they could be addressed in terms of uh, seeing how governments and uh, private sector could participate. And even for the Council of Europe, there's, a real, there's been a realization uh, recently, um, uh, last year in 2016, as part of, it, a part, as part of its internet government strategy, which is that um, there's a need to work more with companies, internet companies. And so for the last 12 months, we've been talking to companies, uh, internet companies, tele telcos, 
including European telcos and their associations uh, of, of companies, about how to work more closely in dialogue between the governments, the 47 governments in, in Strasbourg and these companies. And so it looks like there's going to be, I mean, I can't, can't say for sure, but it looks like there will be an agreement and a launch of, a, of, a, of, a, of an agreement on more dialogue, a partnership, uh, this autumn. So there are, there are initiatives, there are low-hanging fruit. It means just bringing them together, maybe, you know, um, pinging them and seeing whether we can have a discussion. Thank you, Lee. Did you want to come in now, yeah. Thomas, or later? So, Thomas. Thank you. Actually, uh, some some uh, quick reaction to some of the things that had been said. One is, uh, uh, as as the Nigel from ICANN has mentioned, uh, the Swiss chairmanship of the GAC. Um, what, what I learned during this, and that has got to do with what, what Laurie mentioned about languages, that one of the key challenges that this multi-stakeholder model, as it is uh, cultivated in ICANN, one of the key challenges is the language problems. And I'm not only talking about English versus, English versus Spanish versus Arabic and so on. I'm talking about the different codes and the different meanings of words and the different ways that people think and express themselves among stakeholders. And this is something that even after uh, almost uh, 10 years at ICANN and after some people from, from other uh, stakeholders that have been at ICANN since the beginning, we are still having problems in understanding what we mean when we use some words, when we say something as government, you, you come from a government logic, and, and then a, as a, a sentence or an advice that is very clear for us is completely misunderstood by business people or by civil society people just because they do not participate in the same environment and do not read and write and talk to each other in the same environment as we do. And that has led to a number of, of, of misunderstandings and difficult situations that first we had to realize that it's actually not so clear for them as we thought that, that what we said or what we expect is. And, and, and it is only through intense discussions and, and enge uh, engaging with each other that you sometimes realize that you actually think you talk of the same thing, but actually you are in completely different planets. And it takes, uh, uh, first of all, time to, to, to get used to each other and the way you're thinking. So this is just one of the elements that I think we should not forget when we talk about multi-stakeholder approaches and cooperations, and uh, that, that we are mindful of these differences or barriers that are normally not intentional, but we often, that, but they are there and we often forget them. I just wanted to raise that because that's one of my key learnings uh, in, in the ICANN world that I have, uh, and not just me, I guess, quite underestimated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Next in the queue is Shagun, and then Mamadou and Mark. <coughs> you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, add my voice to on how we can improve uh, participation, uh, especially the government and the Paris sector. Now, I want to share the, just a little experience I have in my country. I had the privilege of being the one that designed the current uh, Nigerian Internet Governance uh, Program. As usual, the stakeholders, they were like uh, wanted to use the usual styles, approach, and all that. But we identified that there's a problem somewhere. The governments are not always uh, being part of it. What we have mostly, they are civil societies and um, general members of the citizen, um, the public and citizens and all that, maybe few of the government institutions. But the lawmakers, and the security and all the uh, sectoria, they have not been part of it. But I identified something. We identified that why can't we align our program with the policy, with the national economy and policy of the government, which talk about uh, prioritizing six area, that is agricultural, uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare. Um, service delivery, etc. Now, let me share this with us, just probably to learn on how we can probably attract the government to be part of it. 
under the track session of access, inclusiveness, and diversity. Applying uh, the approach we've always been using, but this time we change that concept. We talked to ourselves, why can't we talk about empowering rural agricultural community under that track sections? Because agriculture is part of the prioritized area of the government uh, economic agenda, which at the same time fall under the framework of SDGs. Then let me use another example here. Under the internal economy, well, we were talking about connecting the next billion. But under the Nigerian government economy plan, they are talking about how how can we enable uh, trade, uh, commerce? How can we increase our GDP? Now, I provided an intervention here. So why can't we talk about empowering trade, investment, and industry for inclusive growth? That should fall under the internal economy. Now, what I'm saying is that not until when we begin to intercept the internet governance with the national policy or with the policy that government uh, have always been, you know, trying to address. Because I'm a little bit surprised too that when I look at the top 10, um, the, the top 10, uh, the, the soccer workshop that we had, and I discovered that out of the top 10, we have issues bordering on human rights. I, I was wondering, what happened to the sustainable development issues like hunger, poverty, address energy issues? Why can't we diversify it? So I think to re echo what other speakers said, there's a need for us to really look at what can bring government back to the internet governance, especially using the internet governance forum to address certain things as that has to do with uh, the government. Then when you address the government, I think to me, it occurs to me that the private sector will naturally respond to it because the policy of the government has a bearing on the directions of, of the private sector. Uh, for now, I, that's just the little in, interventions I will let you make. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Shigun. Very interesting. We have Mamoudou Lowe in the queue, then Mark Carvel and Raphael Denant. Um, so I just saw Jack in Wisdom, or maybe I just haven't refreshed. In any case, Mamadou is next in the queue, and then Mark Carvel. Hello. Thank you, Chair. I am Mamadou Lowe, Mamadou Lowe for the record. Uh, regarding communication issues, Communication issues toward community above all government and private sector. I see three ways working group co has to give support to enhance communication and, and outreach within IGF. First, is internal communication within MAC managed already by Secretariat and how MAC members above all work, working group co can give support. Second, communication between MAC and world community on IGF managed also by Secretariat and how Working Group Co. can give support and help to develop new versions on the, on the six UN languages of the IGF website. Third, IGF and World Internet Governance Community Information Support. In this field, Working Group Co. has to develop tools on documentary support like weekly web review we, already, we are already doing. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mamadou. Mark Carvel, you have the floor. Thank you, Len Mark, of our United Kingdom government. I, I just wanted to uh, offer a few thoughts on uh, government um, participation and act actively contributing to IGF uh, sessions. It's, um, as we noted in our feedback on uh, the last IGF, um, we felt that a lot of the sessions were deficient in the, in, uh, in the, in the volume or lack of volume of contributions from government policy experts and uh, we highlighted this as, as a problem in our written feedback. Um, there, there is always a challenge for administrations to resource participation by um, uh, experts, policy experts in a non-decisional uh, forum such as the IGF. It's, 
uh, administrations are, are hard pressed and when you fight for budgets and, and so on, the question is, well, what, what are you going to get out of um, traveling uh, sometimes quite a long distance and spending four or five days um, at, at, at a venue um, and, and you're not negotiating something. So it's, it's, it's always a challenge within administrations to get the resource uh, to participate um, actively in the IGF, um, and and it's a problem I I encounter elsewhere. I mean, I I went to a uh, G20 uh, digitizing manufacturing conference in Berlin, and it was the level of participation there was surprisingly low, given um, the conference was about um, what's going to happen to transform. Uh, the engines of, of the economy, but uh, it's a conference, it's a coming together of experts and uh, you know it's not easy to get the money to travel to these events and take you out of the loop of policy work at the national level at the same time, so there's an opportunity cost and so on, it all has to be taken into account. I, I don't have any easy solutions to that. Um, we, we did note in our feedback that uh, the Geneva IGF pre presents um, uh, perhaps an unprecedented opportunity this year to uh, connect with governments through the, uh, uh, the uh, intergovernmental agencies present in Geneva um, and uh, also um, to, to reach out to governments on the sustainable development agenda, and I, uh, maybe this is one of the key things in terms of um, outreach to developing countries, that uh, the IGF is where you're going to learn how uh, digital technologies, the evolution of the internet is actually going to uh, realize opportunities for economic growth and enhanced social well-being in developing countries and small island developing states. So that's a communication issue to get that across to governments through through the Geneva network in particular. For developed economies, I think it's, well, it's what I kind of hinted at in my earlier intervention this morning in, in trying to um, uh, articulate, well, what is, what is the IGF achieving in in the future look in the on the emerging issues front what's coming down the track government policy experts are going to be i think quite keen to to engage uh in discussions on on future uh internet uh issues on uh you know blockchain we're all looking at blockchain trying to work out what is it what its impact is going to be for example um, Internet of Things, AI, these are all very big issues um, crossing government policy experts' desks. Uh, the communication from the IGF should be come along to this uh, unique global forum and you're going to have the opportunity to engage and interact and meet policy experts, uh, technical experts, uh, rights experts from across the world. Uh, as, as the unique opportunity to help you ground, uh, get your grounding into uh, these uh, transformative um, uh, issues. Um, so there is opportunity, it's all about communication, I guess, to get round that uh, the budget holders' uh, um, sort of negative, likely negative reaction. If you're not going anywhere to negotiate, what is it, what is it, what's in it for us? Um, the only other th thought is remote participation and uh, workshop panelists, ses um, uh, main session uh, organizers should think, well, we need government policy people here. If we can't uh, get them to actually come, let's factor in uh, the remote participation so they engage in that way. So a, a, a few thoughts there are, um, uh, on this, uh, I agree, fundamental issue. Um, there are quite a few governments here today, that's very good, about 25, including those participating remotely. That's, that's uh, encouraging. Um, but you really need to get engaged with the key policy people uh, in administrations who are hard pressed on national work and try to convince them that if you come to the IGF, 
you, it'll help you in your national work. And some of these issues are, are cross-border. You know, they're not going to be the the um, the uh, uh, solely uh, for uh, resolving at the national level. The the solutions and the opportunities are cross-border. Thanks. Thank thank you, Mark. I think we have a online participant. Yeah, we have Mary and Fuad. <coughs> Mary, could you talk to the floor, please? So, Fuad. I can see Fouad. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Excellent, yes. Welcome, Fouad. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to give a small input. Um, I, I, I'm thinking and suggesting on the lines of the data sharing economy, and I'm suggesting linking of open data and open government data as a source of vehicle to promote human development. Um, I've been a long time supporter of Internet Governance for Development, or simply IG for the years, some of you may know. And that we had the opportunity to host the main sessions during IGF in Vilnius and IGF in Nairobi. I believe that we once again have the opportunity to link to IG40 through open data for development. Um, this would also encourage governments that support open data initiatives to share the improvements and innovations that um, have come about using the internet and data as tools for development of society, economy, and government. Um, uh, more of this interest is driven by my own country's participation to the Open Government Partnership and to the um, OECD groups on working on anti-corruption and accountability. So there, there, I, I've seen a great deal of interest by governments uh, in promoting open data, and maybe if we bring this discussion into a more focused or more enlightened um, uh, way through this main session or grouping up in workshops and emphasizing more on open data and open government, I think that would increase a great deal of participation from governments because you know there's a great deal of governments doing it. So it would help drive them in, it would help drive in stakeholders, and as part of the SDGs, when data matters so much to the achievement of these sustainable development goals. I believe that this is one area that we can come back, even if it's just a nuance to internet governance for development, we could still build upon this. So this is my suggestion. Thank you so much. Fuad, thank you for your comments, and thank you for hanging in there with respect to, to um, trying to get into the queue. I also see, just from a quick scan of the queue, um, that Mary Uduma was having a difficulty getting in as well. Um, maybe I could just ask Luis after the meeting to get just a few minutes with Abud and understand what's happening there in the background and why some people are coming in that way versus the queue. It appears as though some of them are having, which may actually be remote connection issues on their part, but if we can just do a quick troubleshoot, that would, that would help. I mean, it's just very frustrating for them, and it's difficult enough participating um, online as well. So I think that was the last one in the queue remotely there, so we'll... Um, we go to Raphael, and then Wisdom and Jack. Um, we're in the queue as well, and then I'll go back to the um, online. So, Raphael, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I'm Raphael from the EPFL, one of the major universities in computer science. Uh, first, I would like to thank the previous speeches. They bring really interesting solutions and ideas. Um, I've got a point on encouraging private industries participation uh, at EPFL which is one of the major computer science university we've never heard about the IGF uh, and I think the partnership with technical universities uh, is one of the s solutions because students are the ones that join industries are the ones that have energies and that, that are interested so that's one point to consider thank you Thank you, Raphael. Um, maybe another set of contact points for the upcoming IGF in Switzerland as well. Um, Wisdom, you have the queue, or the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Wisdom uh, from Ghana. Um, just want to add to the contributions. Um, 
looking at Africa, uh, we have uh, serious problems in Africa. But then to solve this problem, we need to do simple things uh, right. Uh, what are the simple things? I'll take a Greek uh, as one. Uh, we are looking at reducing uh, hunger and poverty in Africa. And then this is a situation where uh, in Africa, our rural folk, uh, they produce uh, the larger amount of food uh, in Africa. And the city just sit down and then they enjoy this food. And now these rural folk are now saying that, okay, if the urban population are enjoying, then we too have to lay down our tools and also go and join them uh, in, Af uh, in the urban areas. So there is this migration issue there. So to address this issue, we actually need to start considering uh, 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 opening up uh, data. We need to get systems that uh, citizens can actually get satisfied uh, with uh, what government is doing for them in a sense that uh, whatever a program that government is giving to the urban populations uh, equally should make some of these things available to the rural folk. Example would be uh, energy, which is electricity, and then uh, internet and all that. These are some of the things that uh, when we do, will actually uh, empower the rural folk to stay in the rural areas to still continue with their farming uh, produce. Uh, in Africa, one other issue too is that uh, when you look at our educational sector, our Greek, for example, is not that captured in the curriculum. I don't know why, but it looks like students are no longer interested in our Greek, but then they are looking at uh, science and, and all that. So this is just one uh, part of the problem within the African region. There is uh, this uh, problem that there is no data available. We are talking of um, reaching the SDGs. Now, there is no data available to actually measure whether we are doing well or we are not doing well. So we need to also start talking to African government to start releasing data. Based on this data, we can actually know which sector is performing, which sector is not performing, and then uh, the issues can uh, really be addressed. So these are some of the things that uh, I think, uh, when we look into it, will help. No, thank, thank you, Wisdom. Jack, you have the floor. Thanks, Lynn. Um, this is Jack and Sam Key speaking as Mac this time. Um, I guess I note with um, both interest and slight alarm um, that gender and human rights is something that still requires to be re-articulated in internet governance spaces um, and internet governance processes today. Um, the Business Geneva Declaration as well as the Tunis Agenda for Action from 2003 and 2005 both have very clear commitments to both human rights and gender, so this is not new. Um, and it does not, shouldn't really need um, re-articulation, but maybe what is new is the application of human rights to new and emerging issues, which is something that IGF really provides for. Um, however, the comments about gender, um, that it's issues that's being limited to numbers, as well as what kinds of devices that women or men use, um, this indicates to me clearly that capacity building is critically needed for this, um, and so that we can really integrate gender into internet governance policy and processes in a much more comprehensive and um, cohesive way. And also governance and discussion about policy doesn't really sit in a vacuum affecting technology without 
um, humans. So if policy discussion misses out on human rights, um, then it's really missing out at exactly what and whom it most affects, people, um, humans, with diversity that starts with gender, but is by no means the only diversity. And finally, if one of the priority issues for IGF is to improve engagement by different stakeholder groups, in particular governments, then human rights is critical since one of the most important role and obligation of governments is to both uphold and protect human rights of its people in terms of civil and political rights as well as economic, social and cultural rights, both online and offline. And IGF is a valuable space to also share and work towards developing best practices for this. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. We have Liesel in the queue, unless you took yourself out. I did take myself out. Things I was going to say have been said. Thank you. And then we'll go to Cheryl. Cheryl Miller, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments and follow up on what's been said already. Um, most of it probably a little repetitive anyway. But I think if we put ourselves in the position to think about what do governments and what do businesses really care about and what do they want? So obviously governments want to protect their people. They want to boost their economies and they sort of want to take the lead in different industries. Industries themselves, they want to increase their stance in the global marketplace. And the, the industry that we represent um, is one that's changing extremely rapidly. And so I think if we think about these different audiences and we maybe get a little bit creative perhaps reaching out more to the entrepreneurship community and the startup community and maybe trying to build in um, whether it not be, you know, we, we've been more creative with our pa different panel sessions, but maybe building in some, some sort of side event that is very attractive for them where they can come and sort of meet new people and, and engage in that way. Possibly also repurposing day zero. I think that there's a lot that can be done with that. I don't know if we're even having a day zero um, for this one or not but almost turning it into a form of a resources exchange for governments. So one example is um, all of the connectivity work, the connecting the next billion, et cetera. It might be a value for governments to be able to actually have exchanges with these different financial institutions and other partners that would actually be able to help them do that when they go back home, rather than just sort of talking about it. And I want to challenge, I know we, some folks have said maybe we need to go back to basis, go back to our main focus, and actually I want to challenge that. Maybe we do need to change a little bit. I think industry is changing so rapidly and sort of the internet ecosystem is changing so rapidly around us. Maybe we should start to think in, in those terms and really make sure that the programming that we're putting together is really reflective of that and it's moving forward. It's going to be something that is so cutting edge. I feel that I absolutely need to be there. You know, the IGF is something where if I don't, if I'm not there, I'm missing out on something. So, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I mean, there are a number of um, comments here. If I can just um, maybe respond to one or two of them. There will be a day zero this year but because of the timing of the IGF day zero is on a Sunday, um, which isn't quite so conducive to people's travel schedules and. <coughs> Check it, you. Uh, sorry, I just thought, uh, you're talking about day zero or you're talking about the high level the leaders meeting? I guess I'm talking about both. Um, maybe just thinking about how we do that overall, sort of how can we make that more of a, a draw. So there are some other types of conferences like the GSR, for example, where they will, they'll do some different closed door meetings just for the regulators and then they have the full conf a conference. I'm not suggesting that we copy that, but just to kind of think about um, from a government perspective what the value add could be for that day. Because for some, uh, you know, it's been mentioned, it's really expensive to travel and spend a week in these different locations, but perhaps, you know, we could at least get people to spend a couple days early in the week and so maybe you, you and I, I know we've talked about this before, where you sort of, you maybe build it sort of top heavy in the beginning for those folks to at least come and participate and then have other things throughout the week for your, your other audiences, so to speak. So something else that is very focused on students. I know folks have mentioned students. The entrepreneurship piece, I think, is a, a spot that you can really grow. 
and the other industries, as Marilyn and others mentioned as well, you know, the automobile industry, et cetera, thinking of telematics and sort of all these different cross-sectoral um, points. But the problem is going to be outreach and explaining to these industries what internet governance is and why, and why they should care. Uh, because I think even within our own industry, I find myself having to explain the, the work that we do over and over again to people because it just, it doesn't come, it's not, you know, second nature to really kind of understand the point. You've got, you've got to sort of explain three points before before people can fully understand. And a lot of it is the language as well. You know, internet governance sounds remote. And so someone else made a comment earlier, and I thought it was a very good comment about really thinking about when we, when we ex explain to people the purpose of coming to the IGF, to think about the words that we choose, because certain words are buzzwords for certain people. Thank you. No, thank you. So let me just try and clarify a little bit, too. So, so day zero is a series of events that are held outside of the IGF program, and it's, it's basically, um, if the space is there, those rooms are available. So there's certainly room to you know, court and organize some of those other efforts. Specifically to the high-level event, which has traditionally taken place on day zero as well, um, the Swiss are actually trying to, um, I think, help the IGF resolve something which has been a, a long-standing kind of critique which is the opening ceremony, which tends to be this long parade of individual speeches. So um, they've um, shared a couple of thoughts, and we'll talk some more about that on Wednesday. Um, we actually talk about the main session and opening and closing session somewhat. But that's one opportunity to reinvigorate um, some of that activity. And then, of course, we could still um, revert back to high-level events on day zero um, in successive years, if that's of interest to the host country. Um, but I, again, I, I'm trying to, I think, get ahead of potentially some confusion on the day zero versus high level events, which tend to be grouped, but really, really shouldn't be. Um, I think you made a couple of other good points as well, and maybe there's even some specific requests we can do in terms of getting policymakers and governments into some of the workshops and, and proposals that are eventually selected. Um, I have Sala in the queue next. Sala, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to pick up on um, Jack's uh, comments in relation to um, uh, the notion that there may have to be um, some level of awareness in terms of uh, uh, gender and uh, things like human rights and whatnot. And uh, the comments that I'm going to make would probably sort of uh, link into things that would be discussed. Uh, tomorrow, but I thought I should make it now in case anyone would would want to comment further on it. Um, so one one of the things one of the things that I've been observing is that uh, within the IGF context, uh, human rights tends to be sort of uh, sidelined into um, a thematic topic on its own, and I have to be careful how I word it because it might not be perceived as. Um, I might not be communicating what I'm trying to communicate <laughs> properly, uh, but what what I'm sort of trying to say is like uh, essentially almost anything that you can pick up, and again it depends on how people see it. Uh, personally, for me, and I make this as a personal observation, has a human rights component, whether it's access, whether it's things like education, for example. It, uh, it's a, for most countries, it's a constitutional right to, uh, for a person to have the right to an education or the right to shelter. And I noticed Wisdom talked about uh, hunger and security. I think he mentioned hunger and poverty. Uh, and, and so um, whilst the globe is divided in terms of the nature of the rights, whether it's economic, social, cultural, or, or political, and security, whilst the world is divided into that. I think one of the challenges um, that lay with the MEG would be in terms of how do you, how do you create a culture where uh, people's basic rights are embedded into the, um, embedded into the thematic processes 
where you know it's not sidelined into an ordinary tag for example 45 tags on human rights or 45 tags on on such and such as opposed to uh, a philosophical approach to to how we uh, bring the collaboration where you reduce the disparities from both ends uh, when I say both ends I shouldn't I'm not saying north and south or east or west or, or cultural disparities or geographical disparities or political disparities or even geopolitical disparities or power disparities but how do you reduce this so this is something uh, for the MEG to to sort of discuss particularly in the next uh, you know going forward because these are actually very strongly linked to um, to bridging the SDGs or meeting the goals by 2030 uh, that's all thank you chair thank you Sala we're sort of coming to the close there's one more agenda item at the at the very end here but I think we're sort of coming to a close on this session um, I think there have been a number of good ideas here there are a number of good um, suggestions that have come through in the retreat and and various other um, improvement discussions um, I'd also make the point that of course it's also um, important that we all do everything we can to promote this to all of our um, colleagues um, whatever stakeholder group they come from um, you know in our everyday activities so I think um, everybody should take that responsibility home as well um, while continuing to think of things we can actually do collectively as an IGF or a MAG but let me see if there are any um, further comments again this was the 13th agenda item which was an open discussion on ways to encourage governments and private sector participation so I also see some comments in the chat room that um, says maybe it's taking some time to get recognized here in the room or not allowed in a second time if you want to speak so I will wait and see if anything pops up through the online through the remote online or or here in the room Renata, you have the floor. Um, yes, um, to the point again of um, participation and speakers uh, and, and uh, different stakeholder groups, there was a, an, a, an idea uh, in one of the many, uh, in one of the conversations about the um, language use so um, again I think the, the one of the things that I remember quite clearly from the beginning of 2016 was the visibility discussion of IGF outcome documents how great work was being done in the intersectional but some of these documents uh, weren't uh, explored or weren't seen uh, in, a, in context as they deserve to be. So uh, again, uh, I, I see, and, and I think this is, comes at the moment that we're also uh, approaching the end of the day of open consultations and starting a deep dive in our workshops. Uh, the IGF is like a mosaic, and if we don't have all the, all the, all the pictures, all, uh, if we don't see all stakeholder groups, we tend to imagine that they aren't there. But um, also, I concur with Juan, uh, even uh, late, that uh, he, he spoke that uh, private sector and government need to find interesting this dialogue at the IGF. And uh, I think, but I don't agree that the themes we brought are not, are not interesting like um, algorithms and uh, uh, digital recognition, for instance, is quite an, an interesting theme. So I think we need to probably create a few more problematic themes and try to put this in the context, try to work this language of such uh, revolutionary themes. So just uh, uh, leaving this thought, thanks. 
Thank you, Renata. Is there anyone else looking for the floor on this topic? Let me just do, okay, Mark, Mark Carvel, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I, Mark of our United Kingdom government, just um, following on from that uh, comment, um, I just wondered if uh, there is a plan uh, to brief missions here in Geneva, you know, to convene a, uh, an opportunity to brief all the uh, government missions here at, uh, um, at the UN, uh, and with that you could provide um, uh, links to the outcome documents from last year on connecting the next billions and, and cyber security, etc. Um, an outline of the next tangible outcomes. And then, um, uh, following on what I said earlier, uh, a brief digest of this is what IGF is going to do on digital future and on sustainable development. So you've got a kind of neat package there that will be the signal out through the missions back to governments. This is why you need to be here at the IGF 12 in, in December. So I just float that as a thought. Thanks. No, thank you, Mark. Those are very good suggestions. Thomas? Thank you, and thanks to Mark for this suggestion. Actually, we're doing so many things that I forget the details about what, what uh, it is that we're doing. But um, we, of course, we have the mission on our radar, too, and one of the uh, vehicles that we use and have been using and will continue to use is, of course, the Geneva Internet Platform run, run by Diplo on behalf of the Swiss government um, that is regularly organizing briefings uh, here, CO Plus, and also online, and, and, and also, let's say, private ambassadors briefings. And, and, uh, but we'll have uh, the missions are one of the uh, one of our stakeholders, target stakeholders that we. Ta I, I can't tell you whether we've already uh, our mission here. By the way, who is very active and very supportive, um, uh, they have actually organised something already, or they will. But it's definitely on the radar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. I don't think there's anybody else in the queue. I have to admit, I've got so many screens open here. Right now. <laughs> At the moment, it's not in front of me, but I think not. Um, uh, just a, a couple of quick, quick points. There's been, um, in one of the chat rooms, some questions on um, what's involved in hosting an IGF meeting. So I've asked Changatai if he'd just give a very short um, couple of sentences on that, um, mostly to dispel some of the um, I think incorrect information that's floating around in the chat room. And uh, check it out, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just to, I'm just answering my questions based on what I see in the chat room as well. Um, uh, first of all, you do need a government sponsor, so it, it can't be any other stakeholder group. It has to be the government that approaches the United Nations to host an IGF meeting. And um, they do have to sign a host country agreement that's between the government and the um, United uh, Nations. The government is responsible for all costs of the meeting, uh, hosting the meeting, that is the venue, the uh, transcription, uh, setting up the computers, um, all that. And um, I don't know what other. Oh, yes. Uh, the numbers is uh, 2,500, I think. Uh, that would be a good um, estimation of how many people come. I mean, of course, there might be slightly more, slightly less, depending on where the place is and um, what time of the year it is set, if it's clashing with other meetings or not. Um, if anybody's got any other specific questions, you can ask it now. I can answer, or you can come and see me, and um, I can answer them as well. Uh, this is just the rough things. Mm. And, and let me just add one or two. Um, so it, ultimately, the approach to the UN and the contracts are all signed by the government, because it is a UN-hosted event. Um, we've had a number of people approach us that 
weren't from the government but said there's significant interest in my government or in my country or amongst other stakeholders. So the initial thought can, of course, come from any stakeholder, but yeah. ultimately, mm -hmm. as it progresses, it needs to be an engagement between um, a government and, and the United Nations. Um, there was another point I was going to make a moment ago, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to add on that point, yes, um, we've had various uh, multi-stakeholder um, host country organizing groups, but um, the lead when we're making um, negotiations with um, the United Nations has to be government. It's just the way that um, it, it, it is right now. Oh. And again, we have um, 2019, 20, 21 are fairly oversubscribed in terms of a number of very serious offers we've received to host the IGF. 2018, next year, not. Um, we were actually hopeful that we had a, a couple of countries that would do that, but various things such as political elections and all sorts of other things either happened or happening um, have taken some of those off the table. So we're um, redoubling our efforts for 2018. And I said I think 2019, 20, 21 will take care of themselves and that'll give us the lo longer runway. But um, you know, I've always said you can't, you won't get anything if you don't ask and it's not known. So this is in, in the light of um, making it known that we are in fact looking for Post for 2018, and um, if there are um, substantive suggestions, then please reach out to either Chengatai or I, and hope that kind of answers the question. There's a whole series of, of in fact, they're online, the sample country documents, the sample contracts, all those things are actually online, which give a lot more detail, but I think we've discovered the kind of pertinent things here. I have a couple of more um, quick housekeeping. Um, Lewis, I've just seen a whole spate of comments in the chat. And Lewis is trying to, I think, help people understand how to use the electronic queuing system if you're participating remotely as well. Um, maybe those um, instructions can actually be updated and um, reposted. Uh, and maybe there's even a different set of instructions if you're participating online versus in the room here. But you know, the, the whole purpose of that system was to, as has been said many times today, equal the playing field between um, online participants, people in the room, but I'd say even between people in the room, because when a topic is opened up and 10 flags go up, whoever is on the list, first, second, and third, happens to be wherever the person who's recording the queue is looking. So this actually is a much more equitable system. And um, as Lewis so rightfully said in the room, if we want it to be successful, we actually have to use it and just share um, any improvements or et cetera that you'd like to see. But I think it's been, from my perspective, sitting here trying to manage the queue and Chengatai's as well, I think it's been a tremendous um, aid, tremendous boon to the system. And most critically, it really will equal the playing field in terms of all participants, so please. Um, work with Lewis to, um, to help that. At the same time, I'd like to thank Abud in the back as well, who I think maybe was a little bit surprised by trying to manage all of these different systems and has really done a great job at responding to a lot of the comments in the chat room and, and here as well. So I'd just like to express my appreciation for that. And while I'm here, I suppose we should express our appreciation again for all the support of the ITU staff in terms of supporting us here. And note that we are meeting in a different room tomorrow. Yes. Um, in, in the which, tower block. In the tower block. Um, oh, um, I just have to ask you, Eleonora. Eleonora, what room? <laughs> room A. Room A. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> room A um, in the tower block. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, the question, you might want to turn your mic on. The question is how do we actually most efficiently enter the building? Um, I would use the same entrance and just follow the directions for tower building. Um, but there is also the tower building entrance on, um, I don't know what the road is called though, unfortunately. I, I, yeah, I actually think having experienced both of these and having experienced trying to go from this building to the other, you can do it internally, changing floors up and down as you move, which isn't the straightest. You can, if you come in to this building, you can walk back outside, look to the tower, walk across the streets to the tower and enter that way or enter from the tower. Um, and if you just Google ITU tower, you'll get the exact address. I'm also forgetting the, the street number, but that would be the most, um, the most direct there. Um, 
let me just see if there are any other admin and then I'll go to G who has his hand up again and then we were going to have a, a short um, tribute to one of our MAG members. So first, Chengatai, is there anything else from an administrative perspective or no interpreters to thank this time? Just yes, no interpreters, just the scribes. Um, so I would like to thank um, the scribes. Um, really excellent, excellent efforts again, which I know I have to say I rely on. I rely on significantly when I've had another quick chat in the room and I find behind, fall behind, I can quickly go to the, and, and look for it. So, um, Liesl has her hand up, G, and, well, let me go to Liesl first. Thank Looks you, and like I'm sorry for not using the cue, but I just logged off. Um, sorry about that. Um, thank you for giving me one quick question for tomorrow's logistics. Um, Chengatai, you had mentioned a briefing on the trust fund. Can you? Can you give the exact time um, and location for that? Thanks. We're going to have it in room A. Um, we'll just give like 10 minutes for those people who are interested, to, uh, those people who are not interested to leave, and then we'll start at 10 past. If. Oh, you want lunch first? I don't know. Will we lose lunch if we're too late? Mm. Sorry, on the mic, the will of the briefer, sorry. No, no, it's okay, I just asked Chengatai, <laughs> will we lose lunch if, if everyone's too late, because. Well, you can't eat in the room, so, I mean, you, oh, we can have it at two o'clock and then power through if you want. Um, okay, uh, that's the will of the room. Um, that's the will of the room, I was gonna. What is the will of the room? Uh, no, two is two o'clock is the will of the room. I was going to quote one of our secretariat staff of the lunch, but I won't. Um, yes, two o'clock is fine. No. Um, I'd also like to thank again the secretariat for all their preparation um, in terms of getting us here and the on-site preparation here here in the room. It was a great effort from a very small, dedicated team. And then G, you were looking for the floor, and then Elizabeth will come to, to your item. G, you have the floor. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask a quick first ask a quick question about how hosting of the the IGF annual uh, retreat a meeting. How much would it cost? Because I'm considering if uh, Beijing would like to host uh, the future meetings, not necessarily next year, but in the in the future. And the, the second about. Uh, Briefing during the the lunch time, um, since we have cut the uh, French uh, simultaneous interpretation, that saves a lot of money. Could we, in the future, when we have such briefing, we uh, we can arrange a decent buffet for for, for participants? Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the suggestion. Um, We'll look into that one. Um, f for the <laughs> for the uh, costing, um, we don't really know because um, each country has got different costing. Sometimes the, the the government owns the venue, so it's very so it's much cheaper. Sometimes they don't. They have to go out and uh, commercialize the whole process. You know, put it to a commercial entity, so that's much more expensive. Uh, what we can give you is the costs for the UN participation, which is quite easy. We can give you a cost estimate for that. Um, but for, for the rest, um, mostly we leave it up to the host country to figure out. But we can also talk um, offline. I mean, I'm very well willing to Would the to. $10 million be sufficient? It really depends. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Thomas has the floor. Thank you. And, and just to add what, what uh, Cheng Etai said to, to a, a Chinese colleague, it absolutely depends on where and how uh, you do it. It depends. The, the, the most important things is the location, then transportation. If you have to have buses for thousands of people throughout the city because there's no other way to get there, that makes a huge impact. 
the availability, availability of food, um, and then of course the price niveau of the country, of the of the city, whatever. Um, so and the effort that you did you take on communication, and um, so there's no limit to to the upside or whatever you call it. Um, so it's uh, it really is very individual. But uh, I guess all the past hosts are happy to to tell you about their situation if if, if you're interested. So then you can maybe compare which of the past situations is closest to one that, that may be comparable to yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just say, there's, there's lots of detail to this that we can't possibly cover here. You know, we've had many of these discussions for IGF participants don't expect lunch to be paid for them. They simply want to be able to grab a lunch quickly within a very tight schedule and in a place that facilitates 2,500 hungry people getting lunch in a relatively short period of time. So there's a whole bunch of details for every one of those line items that we're happy to, to go through um, for folks that are seriously interested in, in hosting. Um, again, it is a UN event, so there are some specific UN costs, UN security, and that sort of thing um, that, again, we, we can put together. But there's a lot of details, and just throwing figures out and even throwing pictures out of what they pay for does not necessarily reflect kind of the range of possibilities here. Um, Shagun, you've asked for the floor. I'd really like to, to close it. If you could make it really, really short so we can take the one last item and not, not hold people up. So Shagun, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. I will be very short. Uh, we have a request from the members of um, the Working Group on Communication. We want to have a kind of a meeting, a scam meeting with online uh, uh, participations. I don't know if uh, we can be considered to have that before the end of the MAG meeting. Uh, so if I understand you correctly, you're looking to have a meeting outside of the MAG meeting hours, but are looking for a room in some facilities? Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we just take that up with Shanghai outside, I mean, uh, offline. Yeah. <clears throat> Wednesday, not yeah, Wednesday, he's saying quickly, Wednesday at lunchtime would appear to, to be a possibility at this point, mm -hmm. but and take it up with him offline. Marilyn, you have the floor, and that really is the last intervention, so I can go to the last item. And again, I apologize for not using the queue, but I wanted to ask Chengatai very briefly if he would remind all of the MAG members about the um, IGF uh, informational session on Thursday, because for those who are still here and who may not have noted it, I think it'd be great if they were aware of it. Thank you. Yes, exactly. We're um, holding an IGF informational session on Thursday. Um, yes, you're, I mean, it's mostly aimed at people who don't know much about the IGF, but, I mean, you're welcome, of course. Um, again, I will ask Eleonora to give the room. <laughs> So it's at 2.15 on Thursday. Uh, it's actually a very short session. It's only 45 minutes. Um, and I am looking for confirmation on the room myself. So please give me a second. And thank you, Lynn. I mean, Marilyn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's room C2. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, with that, I, I just want to thank everybody um, for coming. This next item, I think, is going to be a little difficult for some people. So we will close the meeting immediately following that particular item. But I just want to thank everybody for the participation. I want to thank all the community participants and members um, for all their comments. Please, please keep them coming. Um, it really is essential that we hear what's working for you. This is obviously um, everybody's internet governance forum, and we're here to try and steer the overall process. So it doesn't stop simply with the end of this open consultation, but do keep the, um, the comments, comments coming. With that, We'll see everybody here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I'm grateful for a short member, a moment of our time to remember our friend and colleague, Joe Aladeff, 
who, as most of you know, passed away too early in this life after a battle with cancer. Joe was one of the most insightful and informed members of our business community to serve as an ambassador for our common goals. He encouraged people to see the value in IGF and to gain insights from it. Joe also served as a resource to this community across stakeholders who wish to engage in an exchange of views. His professional credentials included serving as Vice President for Global Public Policy and Chief Privacy Strategist at Oracle, as well as Chair of the ICC Digital Economy Commission and an Officer of ICC Basis. He was also Chair of the Business at OECD work on Digital Economy, the US India Business Council Digital Economy work, and many others. Last year, despite already fighting this illness, Joe was in Guadalajara, and he spoke on the tra trade main session panel. In Brazil, Joe moderated the Internet Economy and SDG session, and he's been an actively engaged uh, participant and, and, and uh, member at IGF since the beginning. This made him an even more compelling advocate when he spoke of, on IGF's behalf during the UNGA WISIS Plus 10 review. Joe served ICC members in the business community at large, often giving his time and leadership to help ensure business was counted, but also that business was engaging. He served ICC and BASIS mem members as a de facto leader at key moments. His professional legacy would take more time than we have, but I will note for those of you here that he served the broad business community as the ICC BASIS representative on the IANA, Stewardship Transition Steering Committee, and he engaged actively in bridging privacy divides across the global stage, most significantly invested in APEC cross-border privacy rules and the Pathfinder work that led to them. Finally, let me say that Joe was a global citizen. His family extended to friends around the globe. Just from all of the emails that we have received from friends in every region, we know that it was his intellect and experience and perception that earned him great respect. But it was his humor, his empathy, and his deep appreciation of all things human that made him loved and cherished. Thank you for sharing this moment to remember him and his invaluable contribution to our collective mission. Thank you, Elizabeth. I know many of us worked with him for years, so. <laughs> it's a loss. Thank you. And we'll see everybody tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in room A in the tower. Thank you.